Yes. Okay, well, welcome everybody today. Yes. We're happy everybody's arrived. Uh, my name is Jonathan Carlson. I'm a neurosurgeon. This is Jason Aldrin, neurologist, and we're going to talk to you today about Parkinson's disease and essential trauma and dystonia and surgical treatment for that. So I'm very excited that you're all here. Uh, Jason is a movement disorder neurologist. Does anybody know what that means? He's good at moving, right? So that's a two-year fellowship after he finishes his residency in neurology that specializes just in these diseases, Parkinson's disease and central tremor and weird movements that sometimes people get. So he's very well educated and trained. He moved here about a year ago from Wisconsin. Wisconsin, I want to say, Minneapolis. And so we've really enjoyed having Jason here. He's a great addition to our team. Uh, takes care of your Parkinson's. So let's first of all do a little questionnaire for everybody. Um, anybody who has Parkinson's, put your arm in the air. Okay, everybody with essential tremor, put your other arm in the air. Very good. All right. How about dystonia? Excellent, got a couple of dystonia. Very good. Um, well, Jason is going to talk about the disease and the medicines and all that aspect of it. And I'm going to talk about the surgical treatment. And then Jamie Mark back here in the back is our nurse practitioner. And she does the programming and adjustments of the devices that we're going to talk about. And she's going to get up and give you a couple description of how she does that. And then we got some patient examples. We're going to come and turn the device on and off. That's always kind of fun. We got a lot of videos to keep you away. No cartoons, though. Okay, Jason. Okay, can everyone hear me? Let me put this up a little higher. Everyone hear me okay in the back? Our telehealth sites, we want to check and make sure they're able to hear as well. Are they good? Okay, great. Well, just tell me to speak up if, if at some point it takes off. So uh, very happy to be here today at Sacred Heart talking about deep brain simulation and movement disorders for Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia. Uh, as Dr. Carlson mentioned, I've been here about a year. Very happy to be here. Uh, trained out at OHSU in Portland for four years. This was got me out from my home in the south in Tennessee out to the northwest. And uh, after being in Wisconsin for about five years, really just missed being out here and uh, had a great opportunity to join the, the Spokane Movement Disorders team. And uh, very happy to be here working with them and you all as well as our patients. Uh, just a quick word about, you know, kind of my practice and kind of our group, uh, just a bit about that. Uh, I work with Northwest Neurological, I'm a partner in the practice. We're an independent outpatient neurology practice. We focus heavily on Parkinson's and movement disorders. Uh, my partner, Dr. Greeley, has uh, been in practice here for a long time and uh, it's a very, very strong, uh, long-standing movement disorders clinic for the last uh, 16 years and running. Uh, we, we do other things as well, stroke and spasticity management after stroke, uh, dementia treatment and prevention, uh, neuropathy management, diagnosis, uh, migraine and other headache disorders, and, and really all neurological conditions. And, you know, those of you who have maybe even other neurological problems realize that we could use more neurologists in Spokane, so we don't really turn people away, uh, but uh, we do have a, a very heavy focus on Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. Uh, you know, what do we do? What does a neurologist do? Well, uh, my, my daughter once, uh, we were going to a neurology meeting and, and she said, Dad, I want, to be a, I want to be a neurosurgeon someday when I grow up. And I, I said, well, that's really wonderful, Sophie. That's, that's great. Well, do you maybe want to be a neurologist? Well, no, Dad, neurologists just sit around and read magazines all day. <laughs> so, so, you know, I think sometimes people wonder, what would a neurologist really do? Well, well we, we certainly prescribe medications. We do try to keep up with journal articles, and we do read, med, uh, read magazines and try to keep up on the new ways of diagnosing uh, patients. Uh, new therapies, of course. Uh, at Northwest Neurological, myself and Jamie Mark as well, our neurological nurse practitioner, work with deep brain stimulation, patient selection, so selecting patients for surgery, uh, brain programming, uh, Botox removal disorders. I inject basically every part of the body that, that, that you can to, uh, that uh, ha could have involuntary movements. Um, uh, do a diagnostic EMG and nerve studies as well for neuromuscular disorders. <laughs> And really, what we've been working on over the last uh, year or more, and it's really been long-standing, just trying to formalize it a bit more, is uh, this, this idea of the Inland Northwest Parkinson Center. And uh, this is a movement disorder center, not just for Parkinson's, but many different kinds of movement disorders. Uh, a collaboration between Northwest Neurological, uh, Jamie and, and, our, and mine, our practice. Uh, inland neurosurgery, uh, 
becoming part of Sacred Heart here. And then Sacred Heart Hospital, which has a, a very long tradition of performing uh, DBS surgeries with, with great outcomes. Uh, we also are involved with the research for movement disorders. People don't often know this, but we're, we're continuing to grow our research program. We have a, a really neat telemedicine study for Parkinson's disease, in-home uh, telemedicine for Parkinson's disease that we're one of 10 sites nationally doing this. Um, and also, we're uh, planning a, a big uh, deep brain simulation trial, looking at deep brain simulation under heavy sedation, more of a sleep DBS. Right now, it's uh, uh, not done uh, very often at all, but that's something that maybe Dr. Carlson could tell you more about. And this is our team, uh, really a great group of people uh, committed to uh, helping those with Parkinson's and other movement disorders, you know, live better lives, and uh, we work, you know, together across disciplines to ensure that that happens. So, Lee Majors, does anyone remember Lee Majors? <laughs> Who thought they would live to see the day of truly bionic people, humans and machines coming together? I, you know, I watched this when I was, I guess, reruns when I was a kid. But uh, you know, I think it's pretty mind-blowing that we're up, that I'm up here speaking about uh, the implantation of, uh, you know, mechanical electrical devices to improve the lives of people. and. You remember the $6 million man was in a horrible accident, right? He, I think he was a soldier or something like that. It was a horrible accident. And through the use of, of bionic uh, or of electrical equipment and implanted devices and such, became a superhuman. Uh, we're not quite there yet with deep brain stimulation, uh, but it, it is uh, intended to, to be a therapy that makes uh, lives better uh, through in, implanting devices. So it's, I, I just I love science fiction. And I think it's really remarkable how very often science fiction seems impossible at the time, and then before you know it, it's happened. You know, we're, we're kind of living that. So a history of movement disorder surgery. Well, if you believe, believe it, uh, the use of electricity to treat neurological disorders uh, first began in, in, in antiquity. Scribonius Largus, uh, not, I wouldn't really call him a physician, more of an experimenter, used a torpedo fish to treat headaches. I'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> And in and, and the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance, uh, Luigi Galvani and Alessandro Volta uh, were some experimenters that came up with the idea of electricity being the way the brain conducts signals to muscles for movement. And this notion of the brain as an electrical organ uh, first came about, and the heart and other, you know, other or, uh, a couple other organs as well, nerves, uh, which are extension of the central nervous system, uh, you know, uh, having the ability to conduct electricity has been really been with us for a while. Uh, being able to harness that has taken more time. Um, the, one of the earliest examples of realizing that involuntary movements called dyskinesia uh, could be treated by lesioning a part of the brain uh, was developed by Sir Victor Horsley in the late 1800s. So that's really one of the earliest examples. And there are, there are a few earlier, but this was kind of a very well thought out uh, type of uh, plan and, and, and written about really well. Or a, 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 one of the early neurosurgeons, if you will, um, uh, did a surgical procedure on a patient that improved their uh, involuntary movements. And then uh, Lex Sol and many others shortly thereafter, uh, by intentionally damaging specific areas of the brain with surgical precision, improved other aspects of movement disorders. Sometimes this was at very high cost. It certainly didn't catch on because, you know, they improved the involuntary movement, but significant weakness resulted. Can everyone hear me in the back okay? You're cutting out. Oh, it is? <laughs> Am I talking too fast? Let me just hold it up here. Hopefully, give it a short mind. Now, the, the age of mo modern movement disorder surgery first came around in the, the late 80s. Dr. Benedetti Grenoble in France uh, inserted an electrode in the thalamus, an area deep within the brain, to improve tremor left it in there. So this is the first inserted uh, attempt at inserting an electric piece of electrical equipment, wiring basically into an area deep within the brain in, in ways that we're still doing today, actually. We've refined it much more, but the basic idea is still the same. Shortly thereafter, uh, others improve movement disorder symptoms, including tremor, slow movement, and dyskinesia by <coughs> trying another location within the brain. The notion of using, of, of selecting certain areas within the brain, different regions for different types of symptom control was kind of brought into the, the forefront. And that's something that we're still doing today even more so. We're kind of, nowadays, with movement disorder surgery, really looking to try to tailor and pick the, 
the best location within the brain to get the best results. Um, for a while in the 90s, uh, 90s and early uh, you know, 2000s, uh, it, certain regions just kind of came and bow, and this is only the, the, this particular region within the brain is where almost everyone had implants done, but we're actually kind of trying to, to, to get a little more specific with getting great results and the, the kind of results that benefit patients in the long run. So knowing that there are different sites within the brain that can be simulated with these electrodes um, is, is very important. And that's what you're going to hear about today. Particularly Dr. Carlson will talk about that. And then Dr. Vivid uh, inserted an electrode in the, the septum nucleus in 1994 in Ruby Parkinson's symptoms. So we have here the thalamus, globus pallidus, and subthalamic nucleus, different areas within the brain to get different types of results for, for different patient needs. So how does, how does DBS work? See important safety information at the end of the video. Only your doctor can determine if this therapy is right for you. DBS therapy uses a medical device, much like a cardiac pacemaker and thin, soft, flexible wires called reeds completely inside the body. While the device is implanted beneath the skin and the chest, the leads are implanted within the brain. Electrical stimulation is then sent directly to targeted areas within the brain. Stimulation of these areas enables the brain circuits that control movement to function better. This results in a reduction of some symptoms in many patients. So DBS is an electrical treatment. It works by changing electrical firing patterns within the brain. Uh, and in many instances, decreasing that, uh, overactive uh, areas like the subthalamic nucleus uh, so that the abnormal signals become more normalized. I think of this and try to explain it to patients that are really, I really kind of want to know as uh, watching television with static. Uh, you can, can see the picture there, but it's very grainy. You can't get much out of it. Well, DBS sort of acts to, as, as applying electricity to a region within the brain that overall, the overall uh, pattern of what happens is you get better resolution and a return to a more normal electrical firing pattern that, that with the television, for example, lets you see a clear picture. And with the brain, lets the, the movement parts of the brain receive proper, proper signals that allow coordinated movement, not having tremor, uh, better stepping and walking and such. I'm not going to go into detail on neuroanatomy. I mean, we have our expert here, Dr. Carlson, to, to go into that later. But the idea of deep brain stimulation being deep, being areas within the brain, not on the surface, but deeper within the brain, these kind of beige tan areas here, the, the thalamus, the subthalamic nucleus, globus pallidus, uh, the electrodes are inserted deep within the brain because these areas are the ones that are, governed, or that are governing movement programs. And Parkinson's disease, we'll talk about in a bit, is a disorder of slowness and slow movement. Uh, the vast majority of what we do, the way I'm gesturing, the steps I'm taking, I'm not really thinking about. Uh, very little free will is involved in that. Um, most movements we make are, are learned motor programs, and those are the things that are affected in Parkinson's disease, and, and that's what uh, the particular deep, uh, uh, deep structures here within the brain do. They execute and, and run to learn movement, movement programs. If I wanted to, if I decided to make a mad sprint for the door, you're all chasing me. Uh, this part of the brain up top of it would do a lot of that, kind of the volitional control, the ability to voluntarily make a, a, a willful movement. And, and it runs different motor programs. And in fact, that's that's one of the, the things we take advantage of in therapy is, is switching with physical therapy, uh, is taking advantage of switching out from these learned motor programs out to, to volitional motor control, taking voluntary steps, big arm swings, sort of circumvents works around uh, the, the basal ganglia to some extent. So, part, uh, so deep brain stimulation is not experimental. That's one thing I, I want you to remember from today's visit. Uh, I often hear of patients' concerns with deep brain stimulation. There are many you know, very valid concerns that you know, they don't want the surgeon messing around or poking around with their brain. There, was, there were days when surgeons did that. I think I've showed you some examples on from antiquity up where they did go and poke around in the brain. Uh, to, to kind of see what would happen. But uh, with deep brain stimulation procedure, it's really quite standardized. And I think Dr. Carlson will talk more about that 
um, I was, it was very exciting the first couple of procedures I, I went, through, uh, went to uh, to kind of see these changes and such. But then, you know, after we go to them for a while, they're, they're, quite, uh, they're, they're, they're quite standardized in terms of kind of what's been done. It's done in a very controlled way. We have care, actually a lot of the work for deep brain stimulation surgery occurs before a patient ever hits the OR. The preoperative planning, the selection, a lot of the work that we do ahead of time, the testing, uh, is to ensure that patients have good results. And, and at, the time, at the time of the surgery, we really want a, a very standardized kind of approach. Uh, everything's done in a very similar way. Now, you may find things during the procedure that require adjustments and, and different types of uh, uh, maneuvers that you, know, you may not have planned on, but they're usually very minimal and evolved, kind of adjusting the electrode uh, trajectories and the pathway this electrode might go through the brain in very subtle ways. Um, but, but really, it's quite standardized in how we do it. Starting from 1997, uh, deep brain deep brain stimulation has been approved uh, for treating Parkinson's tremor, then on for Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia thereafter. So some local history. When I was uh, uh, looking to get back to the Northwest after uh, uh, you know, being in Wisconsin for several years, I had offers to uh, go to Swedish. Uh, OHSU in Portland, Kaiser, uh, and Bend, uh, and here in Spokane, and I actually chose Spokane over all those other locations for a number of reasons, but one of the, the professional reasons was to work with Dr. Carlson, Dr. Hirschauer, and Jamie, uh, and, and this program, this program is the first DBS program in Washington State was in Spokane, not Seattle, and people often don't know that until, until I tell them. Uh, but Spokane actually has a, a very long tradition of deep brain stimulation surgery and great outcomes and one of the longest uh, active programs in the country and the, the longest active program in Washington State. We have uh, managed over 420 DBS patients combined with Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia uh, through the Spokane DBS team. So what does DBS help? Well, deep brain stimulation we're not going to talk about it today, but, but you, there are psychiatric conditions, actually, that it's being experimented with uh, and, and used. We're not, we don't work with that at our center directly. We uh, work with Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia. I'm going to tell you more about those. These conditions are very responsive to deep brain stimulation when medication is no longer effective or the symptoms are extremely severe. Who can guess what I'm going to talk about next based on looking at this picture? Parkinson's. When you think about Parkinson's disease, what's, the, what, 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 what's one thing that you think about? Someone back in the back. What do you think about when you think of Parkinson's? What comes to mind? Shaking? The shuffle? Tremor? What else? Slowness? Quiet? Very good, those are all, all features. Well, head to toe, let's do a rundown. Tremor, tremor affecting the head, chin, or lips. Mask-like face, so decrease in facial expression. Even with completely normal emotional content, strong emotions like we all would have, the sometimes less expression of, of the emotional content due to the masking of the face. Astute posture, and this is Sometimes one of the, the features of Parkinson's, it makes one think it's normal aging. Oh, I am just thought I was getting older. I don't have a tremor. I just have suit posture, but there's other stuff too. Certainly, you, you see suit posture with normal aging, but, but the degree is usually much worse in Parkinson's. Decreased movement of the arms, decreased arm swing, kind of holding the arms stiff and rigid, flex at the elbow and wrist. Rigidity, muscle stiffness. Rigidity, this is very interesting. This is an extremely responsive uh, symptom to medication and deep brain stimulation. Uh, but rigidity is kind of, kind of goes hand in hand, in my view, with pain. Many people with Parkinson's have pain, particularly pain in the shoulder of the arm most affected. And a lot of that has to do with decreased arm swing, muscle stiffness. A lot of folks with Parkinson's will actually have gone through orthopedic surgery before they were even diagnosed and told us a rotator cuff cuff tear or, or something like that. And then, of course, hand trimmer, leg trimmer, hips and knees slightly flexed, and a shuffling gait. And there are really many other features. The, the key way we make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is to look for slow movement, stiffness, and tremor on one side of the body more than the other in progression over time. Often, the tremor may stay only on one side. Sometimes it will generalize to affect other sides of the body. Stoop posture, small handwriting, 
shift sexual dysfunction, shuffling gait. Uh, at its core, what Parkinson's disease really is is a disorder of slow movement, slowness. Not everyone with Parkinson's has tremor. Everyone with Parkinson's has slowness at some point. Maybe not right away, but, but that's the, the key feature that defines what Parkinson's is. And in most cases, more disabling than tremor, the slow movement. Again, not right away always, but over time. Just a brief slide about medication. So medication response is key to diagnosing Parkinson's. And it, it's important on a number of levels. It's important to derive a medication response to make someone with Parkinson's feel better, to alleviate their symptoms and their suffering with slow movement, stiffness, and tremor. Medications are key for that. One of the, the most exciting things as a, as a neurologist, you know, we don't get to, to do surgeries and stuff like that, but we work a lot with medication and get to use medication you know, carefully micromanage the medication to bring about very dramatic response to Parkinson's <laughs> symptoms. It's very, very rewarding to see that happen. For some people, this will, will go on for years or even decades, a wonderful response to medication but without, you know, having to troubleshoot it too much. Inevitably, we see changes, and the medication continues to work all throughout a person's life, but the, the time what it, which it works, how many hours it lasts, for example, is less and less. This slide shows some couple of quick letters here. I'll tell you about this. The D is a dopamine. So the yellow nerve cell is a cell that's making dopamine deep within the brain, and it produces dopamine, and it's releasing it onto the blue nerve cell, which receives it, and then executes the movement, having normal movement. So dopamine is necessary for normal movement. And then dopamine is uh, uh, taken back up into the cell, recycled or stored. Uh, Parkinson's, this yellow nerve cell, is decreased in number. These are the cells that are degenerating and dying. Uh, very specific, the vast majority of the brain is healthy in Parkinson's disease. But specific cells that make dopamine are not healthy and don't produce enough. Now what we do is give L, the levodopa, carbidopa, levodopa. Levodopa is the active part of the carbidopa, levodopa, or your cinnamon. And levodopa is taken into the, uh, through the bowel, um, gone, goes to the brain, and turned into dopamine. Literally the exact same dopamine your body would make chemically, indistinguishable from the, the dopamine the body makes and what we give with levodopa and how it's transformed into dopamine. Uh, this other uh, little uh, thing here, this DA is a dopamine agonist. This is just an example of another medication we can give that is similar to levodopa, uh, not exactly the same, but very, but very similar. And other medications that enhance the way levodopa works, uh, makes it, make it last longer, prevent levodopa from being broken down or a look-alike the dopamine agonist, your Mirapax, your new Propatch, Requip. Azelect, one of the monoamine B inhibitors, makes dopamine not be broken down as much and stick around longer. So Parkinson's, will we see more Parkinson's in the, in the coming years? The answer is yes. Parkinson's is around more now because we recognize that we're making diagnosis earlier. People are becoming more educated about Parkinson's. People with Parkinson's are living a lot longer now than they used to. In the past, uh, before the, the development of levodopa nearly 50 years ago, a person with Parkinson's on average lived about seven years. It really wasn't very long, and, and they had complications related to uh, falls, uh, being frozen, being able to, unable to get up out of the bed and move. Uh, it would start slow, like it does now, but, but once progression occurred, it was often very debilitating very quickly. And it's, it's rare to run into that nowadays. Over a million people in the United States have Parkinson's disease, and as the baby boomers continue to, to get older, we will continue to see more people from that group. And now that Parkinson's patients are living longer, there's going to be more folks with Parkinson's. A good response to medication early on is key, but over time, the medication response is less robust. The condition itself progresses so that while there are still symptoms of slow movement, symptoms, and tremor that respond to levodopa and other Parkinson's meds, other symptoms develop, other things come up that don't actually relate to dopamine. Falling that doesn't get better with dopamine, changes with the mind, uh, uh, change of low blood pressure, uh, mood, GI symptoms, and, and these are things that we still have an unmet need for that, that uh, occur with progression of Parkinson's. However, deep brain stimulation is a wonderful treatment and a good stand-in for the best response to medication without medication side effects. So, Again, I'm talking about Parkinson's being a slowly progressive condition. One lives with over many, many years and, and decades usually. Um, and when the medication response becomes more tricky, that's when we start to look at deep, deep brain stimulation as an option. Now we'll start on some videos. Um. 
What strikes you all about this video? Tremor? Is it on one side or both sides? Just on the right. You can imagine if he was trying to drink what it would be like. So clearly the tremor can be disabling. I don't, min I don't mean to minimize the tremor, but a Parkinson's is a lot more than tremor, and DBS helps a lot more than tremor. That's one of the key things to recommend. What do you think about this video? What are you seeing already? Slow walking. Kind of has a funny little little limp to his gait too. Now, now what do you see? What do you think his feet are doing? Shuffling, getting stuck to the floor maybe. Now once he goes to the turn, the straight walking is easier. And usually turning is one of the aspects of slow movement and gait Parkinson's that's affected first. Turning uh, is a more complex movement that actually involves cognition and, and other factors as well. So turning is usually one of the first aspects of Parkinsonian gait uh, problems to, to emerge. And that's why it's always important to watch people walk in clinic with Parkinson's. Now this is an example of a person off medication. What's away? Off medication then on medication. So this person requires two, two dots to help him get up out of the chair. Lost tremor, forelimb tremor. And what do you see here? What's that? Yeah, sl slow movement of one side of the leg. So slow movement affects the arms and the legs, both. Usually one side, arm and leg more than the other, then it can spread to both. Now this is a, this is a patient on medication on 300 milligrams of lipidopa, let's say. And what do you see here? What's interesting here? He's faster, right? There's some funny movement going on with the arms. So this is what we call dyskinesia, and this patient's on, so off and on. These are key things. I try to get my patients to talk in these terms to me as much as possible. Um, it, it can be kind of uh, uh, tricky, uh, but you can clearly see here his, his foot tapping. His foot tapping has improved. And you know, again, I kind of make this joke to my patients, well, you know, I'm seeing improvements in your finger tapping and foot tapping, but you're not a professional finger tapper or foot tapper. Um, you know, but, but these are markers, these are measurements that do kind of generalize to other aspects of your daily activity. So when it, whether it's training a screwdriver, you know, whether it's kind of you know, stirring your coffee cup, getting your cup out, you know, kind of repetitive movements. This is why we do this sort of business in the clinic, to, to do standard measurements. Most Parkinson's specialists will, will do standard Parkinson's measurements, you know, along with initial diagnosis and all throughout the course of the condition. And you can, you can literally plot out with numbers um, how severe the symptoms are, more numbers, worse, Fewer numbers, better, zero new symptoms. And believe it or not, we actually see that symptoms reduced almost not, not being present for some people. So the off state is the Parkinson state. Slow movement, stiffness, tremor. That's the untreated state. That's what happens if we do nothing. The on state is the normal state. Good movement when meds are working, but sometimes there's excessive, there's excessive movement. This dyskinesia. This abnormal. Kinesia movement. I actually have degrees in Latin and Greek, and this is the only time I use them. <laughs> Abnormal and voluntary movement. The brain needs dopamine stimulation to have normal movement. When there's less dopamine, the brain becomes sensitive to dopamine stimulation by medication. So taking it kind of at a pulse, 8 a.m., 11 a.m., 3 p.m., boom, 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 that burst of dopamine is what triggers the brain that doesn't have enough dopamine to be overly sensitive. And that's why we see dyskinesia, that pulse of stimulation medication. Early on, we don't really see much dyskinesia, or if you do, if I do, I may be the only one that sees it, and even my patients aren't aware of it. And frankly, I don't bring it up to them because it's not bothering them. They haven't noticed it, their spouse hasn't noticed it. 
So it's very possible to have mild dyskinesia. I'm going to show you some videos of kind of mild and then really, really bad dyskinesia. The vast majority of people usually don't have horrible dyskinesia, uh, although it's certainly one of the reasons we don't uh, give levodopa uh, right away and push Parkinson's meds up to very high doses. We want to be careful with the dose. Uh, dyskinesia goes hand in hand with otherwise getting a good response to movement. And that's why if a person does develop dyskinesia, you can't just decrease their meds to, to fix the dyskinesia. What will happen is the dyskinesia, dyskinesia will go away, but at the expense of normal movement, making it harder for them to walk, having more falls, really having to, to forcibly you know, use that voluntary movement pathway, having to work a lot harder to move. Again, this is a, another patient with a little, a little more dyskinesia affecting the right arm. Has that funny little sense of uh, gesture. And this is a young man with Parkinson's with horrible dyskinesia. And uh, one, of the, one of the worst things about young onset Parkinson's is uh, with levodopa uh, use that they just have a lot, a lot more sensitive uh, uh, they're a lot more sensitive to levodopa, and some of the other meds, they have a, a they, they, they develop dyskinesia a lot more easily at a lower dose. So this is striking. That's not one that you you uh, forget about real, really well. But this is the patient with his DBS on and his meds lowered. And that's the way that we reduce dyskinesia in a patient like this, is we do DBS to kind of stand in for the meds, and then we're allowed to lower the meds. And the meds drive dyskinesia. It's, DBS can drive it a bit too, but we, again, we can adjust the deep brain stimulation. And of course, most importantly, he's smiling. So what is helped by deep brain stimulation? Again, slow movement, stiffness, tremor, slow walking, dyskinesia. It's a misconception and not correct to think that deep brain stimulation is only to treat tremor in Parkinson's disease. The slow movement is a core defining feature in what my patients struggle with most as the disease advances. What we struggle with to manage medication is the, the slow movement. Uh, that's, what, uh, that, that's what makes it so that other people have to do things for you and you lose independence, you have decreased function, and ultimately lives, uh, leads to the lowest uh, or, or contributes to poor quality of life because of the slowness and having to have other people do things for you. No one wants that. That's one of the ultimate fears of all people with Parkinson's, is loss of independence, loss of function. One of every three people with Parkinson's have minimal or no tremor, and they do great with deep brain stimulation. They can do excellent without tremor, and that's another misconception that patients sometimes have. Only you kind of push it off and say, well, it's not for me, I don't have tremor. All the miraculous stuff that I see on the the videos and stuff are for those that have tremor making the tremor go away. And, that, and, and it's important to realize that deep brain stimulation, if you only have slow movement and stiffness, but those Parkinson's symptoms respond to medication, they will respond to deep brain stimulation surgery. And often they're more disabling than the tremor. So what patients are good DBS candidates? Well, again, there's still a short period of good medication response. Walking, use of hands, getting up from a chair, when taking medication, these are a lot better. Maybe not perfect, maybe some, still some sense of poor balance, but they're a lot better. Dyskinesia may, or dyskinesia may be present and bothersome. We don't have to have all of these, any one of them are a good reason. Tremor is present and bothersome and resistant to medication. I have some patients, and this is why I like doing my, my UP or X, this is my movement scoring, uh, because you can see dramatic improvements of slow movement and stiffness and know that a person's medicine responsive, but they still may have a really, really horrible tremor. Patient right now, we've gone through. I mean, we've gone through literally eight, eight or nine medications for his, his condition and uh, his uh, uh, Parkinsonian tremor um, uh, continues. But some of the other symptoms have really improved. But of course, not satisfied, understandably, because he still has this really bad breakthrough Parkinsonian tremor. And for someone like that, deep brain stimulation is uh, going to be a great treatment for tremor that's resistant to meds. Medications being taken frequently throughout the day and hard to take on time. This is another great reason to consider deep brain stimulation. You're having to take the medicines a lot throughout the day. Kicking in, wearing off, or some medication doses fail, they don't respond. Or other symptoms of medication, kind of toxicity, if you will, not really irreversible, but, but um, certainly bothersome. Low blood pressure, nausea, Parkinson's medication will sometimes do that. Some individuals are very sensitive. Um, timing is a really big deal. Timing of Parkinson's surgery, uh, our DBS surgery for Parkinson's. 
we certainly don't want to you know, do deep brain stimulation at the time of diagnosis, at this point at least. Uh, that, that's, that's overkill. But some people will be a diagnosed with Parkinson's in their 80s or 90s, and you know, I mean, what's the likelihood they're going to they're going to need surgery? It's very low, you know, if they're if they are diagnosed late, later in life. Um, there's going to be other problems that will take precedence over the Parkinson's, and you know, that, that's definitely a person we're not we're not looking to really think about this a lot. And I don't always talk about it a lot to my patients who are you know of advanced age. We kind of focus on some different things. Uh, but but uh, there's the risk from surgery. Dr. Carlson is going to talk a lot about risk, and uh, fortunately, we're at a, an institution uh, with surgeons that, that are very careful. We do a lot of careful uh, preoperative planning, and our risk here are, are very low. But like any place that, that does lots of procedures, anywhere you go that does lots of procedures, uh, lots of DBS surgeries, you know, you're having more patients. So there there are uh, things you have to watch out for that will just happen because of the, the numbers of people coming through, and everyone's always a little different. Um, however. Most patients that that uh, worry about deep brain stimulation surgery will kind of worry and put it off, and will will ultimately want the procedure, but it will be too late. So I see far far more people put the deep brain stimulation uh, procedure off until it's too late, rather than those wanting it to be too early. Occasionally that will happen. We'll see someone who really early on who wants it, and we have to say, well, you know, this is going to be great for you, but not right now. Let's just you know, keep taking meds and live life. So when I hear a patient say, okay, I can barely walk now. I think I'm ready for DBS I've been hearing about. Well, if you can't walk and your medications aren't helping you uh, walk and you've got Parkinson's disease, do, do you all think that it will help, uh, doing DBS will help that patient walk? No, definitely not. So if medications are not helping them walk and their goal is to walk, uh, no. However, if, if medications are helping, when, medica when medication is working, if a person is taking kind of normal steps like you saw in the video, normal turns, and, but when the medication is not working, their walking is very difficult or maybe impossible, DPS will help that. But, but if they have symptoms of particularly affecting the gait uh, that don't respond to medication, DPS doesn't help that. Or in general, just the beds no longer work. You know, if, 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 if the meds are, are working but just a little bit and they've had Parkinson's for, you know, 20 years, uh, for example, uh, you know, there's a minimal, the medication response is there, but it's not a really meaningful response to medication, then that person's not gonna be a good candidate for DPS. And, and we see that. I see probably one or two people a month in this situation that are interested, but, uh, but are kind of, kind of progressed or too advanced. This is an earlier patient after deep brain stimulation on lower dose of medication. Okay, who can guess what I'm gonna talk about next? Essential tremor. So if you have essential tremor, or even Parkinson's, it can sometimes look a little bit like this, we'll talk about that. Uh, the, the spiral on the left is a shaky hand spiral of the person trying to write with the essential tremor. The one on the right, is a person without essential tremor, I would say, after DBS. Essential tremor is one of the most common movement disorders. It's a tremor uh, that occurs mostly in the hands, when using the hands for, for manual tasks, usually not present at rest. And this is what separates it from Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's tremor is a resting tremor, usually. You can see Parkinson's tremor when you hold the hands up, but it's usually not as bad as when the person's at rest. Uh, essential tremor, you don't have the tremor when the hands are still, and hands are held up or used for tasks, that's when the tremor begins. For some patients, you actually won't see any tremor at all until they're doing a very specific test, like riding or drinking, and even when they hold the hands up, it's not that bad. Young people get this. My youngest essential tremor patient is 12. And my oldest patient is 95. Uh, and many people, it can run in families, maybe half the, the time can run in families, but not always. There are genes that we're discovering that are uh, uh, probably causes of essential tremor essential tremor in a small number of patients. Uh, sometimes, but not always, it's alcohol responsive. Uh, I take this as part of the history. When we hear about tremor that, uh, that's very responsive to alcohol, uh, this is highly, highly suggestive of uh, essential tremor. I don't recommend my patients go out and drink regularly, but you know, we are in the Northwest, there's IPAs, Walla Walla Wine, so. So for some, a little indulgence around mealtime is just enough for, uh, for what they need, and you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, it can range from mild, and in most people it's mild or mild to moderate, and of course the ones that I see that are coming to a tremor specialist uh, is very severe, or moderate to severe, or, they're, or it's mild and they're worried they have Parkinson's. Now this is the key thing. Uh, 
This is a picture of the brain, sliced down the middle, okay? You're looking at the brain from the side. Um, essential tremor affects this area back here, mainly, this area called the cerebellum. It's the back part of the brain that governs the coordination of movement, coordination of speech, muscle coordination. We see changes in this area. Parkinson's disease affects a completely different area, primarily, an area deep within the brain and the middle brain. So completely different regions are affected uh, in the brain in Parkinson's disease compared to essential tremor. It's a, it's a completely different neurological disorder. There is occasionally some overlap in terms of symptoms, and, and, and occasionally I'll see a person with an essential tremor starting in their, their 20s that, that has developed Parkinson's in their 70s. And you know, I kind of wonder, well, was it Parkinson's all along? Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It, the essential tremor, in fact, is so common. It's really common. It's so common that uh, mathematically, you're going to see a few people that have essential tremor that will just develop Parkinson's disease, too. That's definitely part of this. But in some cases, it's a little more tricky. That's kind of a, some interesting science going on right now. But know that essential tremor and Parkinson's affect very different parts of the brain. They're very distinct conditions. And our treatments, medication-wise, and surgery uh, are, are very different. Uh, this is a slide of a uh, neuroanatomy uh, of the, the cerebellum here. And these, are, these little swelling areas are cells within that cerebellum that are changing. So we can actually see, in many patients with essential, essential tremor, changes in their cerebellum if they die. And, uh, uh, examine the brain uh, at autopsy, you can actually see physical changes in the brain. So uh, we don't really think of essential tremor as a degenerative brain disease in, in the sense that we, we think of Parkinson's as having, you know, that's a, a big part of Parkinson's. We do uh, realize, though, that there are changes actually happening in, in the brain in essential tremor. It's not just a nervous disorder. And that's what a lot of people think, well, it's just my nerves or, or I was stressed out shaking. And, and because stress can drive all kinds of tremor, uh, including Parkinson's tremor, uh, you know, that's certainly a factor. Uh, but it's not the root cause. This is an organic neurological disorder due to changes that are actually occurring in the brain. Medications can be very helpful to treat essential tremor. The tremor is mild, mild or moderate. The classes of medications that we use to treat essential tremor are beta blockers, propranolol, atenolol, primidone or mycelane anti-seizure medication, and others, gabapentin, topiramate. Sleepiness, falls, confusion, low blood pressure, these are side effects of these medications. And, and certainly people that are younger tolerate them very well, but older individuals often do not. One of the misconceptions that, that I try to, to talk to my patients about, you know, when we're, when we're together trying to make a decision about possibly considering surgery is the risk of medication. Everyone's worried about the risk of surgery, obviously. Um, but medication that we use in older individuals to treat their tremor is not without risk. And there's never really been a study done that's compared the risk of treating a person with essential tremor uh, uh, with medication who's, say, over the age of 70 versus deep brain stimulation. So I really can't go and I can't say anything in, in detail about that based on research that's been done. But what I've seen in my own practice uh, that I have, have prescribed these medications for patients is they sometimes will fall, uh, sometimes with inj injuries or have confusion, hallucinations, uh, low blood pressure, queasiness, sickness. So these medications aren't without risk. So we just have to, to think of them that not necessarily as a, the, the, the conservative route. It's just a different route than, than surgery. Uh, Botox may be effective to treat tremor, but has risk of ca causing hand weakness or wrist drop. Uh, there are probably maybe 10 neurologists in the country that, that do Botox or essential tremor. I'm, I'm one of them. Uh, it's this very complicated, probably the, the most complicated type of Botox injections you can do are for essential tremor because you have to isolate very fine muscles and, and dose, the, dose the Botox uh, correctly. Uh, this is not, this is usually my treatment of last choice uh, for my patients, even though I'm the one doing it. Uh, it. It's just, it's difficult. I've gotten very good results often, but, but you know, it's some risk there. A gamma hypothalamotomy uh, can be done to irreversibly damage the thalamus, the area that otherwise we place the leaves into to reduce the tremor. And then, of course, deep brain stimulation is an FDA-approved indicated treatment for essential tremor, for moderate to severe essential tremor that uh, medication doesn't help. And the idea behind deep brain stimulation for tremor is that it's a changeable treatment. And just like it is for Parkinson's and dystonia, it's a changeable treatment. This is a key thing to remember. Um, with, for everyone who has deep brain stimulation done, uh, there's the first tendency to think of having the procedure, going through the, the work of having the procedure done and the stress of that, and then coming out and being done, and that's it. And that would be great if, if, we, if this technology worked like that. 
But the, the technology is not that simple. We, we do have to turn the deep brain stimulator on, and a lot of the work that occurs for, for movement disorder surgery, the ultimate results that we get occur in the clinic in the weeks or months after surgery. The programming and the adjustment of deep brain stimulation, it, it takes a little bit of work, but it's just generally not that difficult. And Jamie and I both spent a lot of time doing this and have training in that. And, and, you know, so while it would be nice to have the surgery and have it done, wake up, and you're fixed, uh, the fact that we can actually change the, the treatment as your condition progresses is really, really wonderful. So while we have to work a little bit to get the settings just right, in the long run, we're also able to adjust the settings to continue to, to make the device work differently as you change, as your Parkinson's changes, as the essential tumor maybe gets worse and breaks through. Deep brain stimulation is changeable. You can adjust it. Other treatments aren't. Certainly the gamma knife, the ultrasound, the alumotomy, uh, they can get great results right away in some cases, but the, the tremor breaks through that for many people ultimately, and, and they get worse down the road. And what are you left with? You, you, you have to go back to meds, basically. Uh, DBS can be turned off. So any side effects from DBS can be adjusted or turned off. If you have numbness or tingling, if you have a little a little bit of arm pulling that happens after deep brain stimulation, you turn it off. Or ideally we adjust it, we don't leave it off, we would just turn it down and adjust it. And with other therapies like gamma knife and ultrasound uh, and thalamotomy, they're all really the same uh, ultimate outcome, burning and damaging the area of the brain. You, if you do have a side effect from that, you can't change it, you're, you're stuck with that. So tremor works with time. Some tremor is not always lethal, but it can cause severe disability and poor quality of life. The ways that we adjust the deep brain stimulation, and Jamie, Jamie will talk a little bit more about this. Um, uh, we can change the energy level, the size of the charge, how fast the device fires, the area of the brain uh, within uh, and after it's implanted. We can actually change uh, to stimulate different regions within the brain uh, along the side of the uh, electrode. Um, for deep brain stimulation, the advantage for tremor particularly is you can treat tremor on both sides of the body. Uh, gamma knife, uh, the ultrasound treatments are really focused on only one side of tremor. If you, if you damage the brain, if you lesion the brain on both sides with gamma knife or, or uh, ultrasound, uh, what you will see is uh, problems with balance, speech, sometimes right away, sometimes a delayed effect with, with balance. Even on one side, uh, after gamma knife, not long ago, I've seen a patient who had uh, some problems with, with balance. So you can't go back on that. And, and it's, it's really nice in the sense that you don't have to have something implanted, and that's the very neat thing about it. But the, the downside is it's kind of a one, one hit type thing. So you get one chance, and that's, that's really all it is. And then whatever happens afterwards is you have to kind of cope with. So this is a patient with the essential tremor with her DBS off. And can you all see anything here? Try to get them as close together as you can without letting them touch. Now notice, her tremor isn't severe. Now, it's not the worst tremor in the world. Like People in this room probably have worse tremor. Like and look what happens when she tries to breathe. As close as you look at her face. So, repeat after me. It's a sunny day. It's a sunny day. The fire is a threat. The fire engine near Earth. Count to ten. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. This finger, touch my finger. Touch your nose. And touch my finger. Touch your nose. So again, not the worst tremor, but definitely functionally disabling for this patient. And that's the thing, a tremor can be severe one day, not that bad the other. It can change a lot. It's not always the same type of tremor. But essential tremor is usually worsened by, by, by specific tasks that are performed. Um, this is turn your spin letter on. This is how you turn DBS on. Boop, just like that. Touch my finger with your finger. Touch your nose. Touch my finger. Okay. And oh, this is what I did with the DBS on here. I should say not off. Slide's wrong. Okay. All right, now try this one. Uh, get them as close together as you can without letting them touch. Okay. Is it able to breathe? There you go. Okay. So, again, I mean, you know, uh, how severe does tremor have to be before a person goes through deep brain simulation? Does anyone have any thoughts? Someone who doesn't have essential tremor, 
or just a care partner or spouse. What do you think? How bad do you think Trimmer would maybe have to be? What would, what would be your line in the sand? Any ideas? Can't feed yourself? What else? Can't hold a cup of coffee. We're Northwesterners here. Coffee is priority. I agree. Well, you know, this is definitely a, a big gray area. You know, kind of when is a tremor bad enough? Some people will tolerate a lot of tremor and not be that bothered by it, and they've maybe had it a long time. And, and you know, even after discussing DPS as an option, they, they feel like it's not, you know, it's not worth it to them. It's not really bad enough, and, and it's a personal choice. It's something that that you have to feel that your tremor is is bad enough for the things that you like to do, the things that you value. Uh, some are embarrassed by tremor, but it doesn't actually affect function. Uh, and they have a moderate tremor, and, and they do well with DBS. It really it reduces tremor, whether it's uh, a moderate or severe. It's not just for the worst tremor in the world. So thinking that you have to wait until your tremor becomes the worst tremor in the world, you know, you certainly can. Uh, but but what you may be doing is bypassing a lot of good quality of life years without having much tremor at all. And, and that's something to think about: how long you want to tolerate these symptoms before having uh, uh, this kind of treatment. Who here has heard of deep brain stimulation for multiple sclerosis? Well, we do it. Uh, I've had uh, lots of patients uh, with, uh, well, I've, I've had 10, probably 10 or so patients with multiple sclerosis, uh, all the way back from when I was at OHSU, when I was at Wisconsin and here in, in Spokane, uh, where they have a, a tremor associated with multiple sclerosis, and the tremor is improved by deep brain stimulation. This is not one of the FDA uh, indicated treatments uh, uh, that associated with deep brain stimulation, but we do some things off label. We know that uh, just like a essential tremor, uh, the MS tremor does have some uh, uh, governance with the areas deep within the brain, and the, we do the surgery the same way we do for essential tremor. And I, actually, I've had amazing results. I've seen wonderful results for tremor associated with MS. What it doesn't do, if you're, if you're aware of MS or knowing with MS, you know, speech, coordination, balance, bladder, these other symptoms of muscle control, it doesn't, doesn't help those. So the, the problem is that a person with MS might have a really, really bad tremor that affects their, and they usually have big tremors when they have it. Um, and, and then with uh, uh, DBS, their tremor is much better, or maybe even gone, but they do still have some coordination problems. So it doesn't help that, but it certainly can take off, take the, the, the big edge off the tremor, the large amplitude, the big movement. And it works really nice for that. I've never seen a trigger an MS flare. I've never read about an, an episode of an MS flare happening after surgery. Um, usually we do one side, and maybe then the other occasion we will do both sides together. Sometimes we do what's called staging one side and the other. All right, if anyone's asleep out there, to wake up. Who's from UCLA? <laughs> Who's from Gonzaga? <laughs> what's the spread going to be? <laughs> Kentucky, man, they, they took up the town last night. So we got a, I think, a 30, maybe? All right, have everyone's attention now. This is my attention getting slide, my wake up slide. <laughs> Everyone's awake now? Okay. Wilter is turning it on. Turn it. Okay. Let's take a look at this video. Who can tell me what this, this condition is? Dystonia. This guy's in his 40s. He's had this for about 10 years. His head turns to the left involuntarily. Involuntary rotation to the left side. Uh, I treated him with botulinum toxin for a number of years, and, uh, and he, he's really done uh, very well as a patient with my own practice. Uh, dystonia is abnormal involuntary muscle spasm. It's a bit of a kind of a complicated condition to explain. Uh, it occurs in its own right as its own condition, its own medical condition, separate from Parkinson's and essential tremor. Although I will say, if you have Parkinson's, you've probably heard about people with Parkinson's having dystonia, and that's definitely seen. We can see dystonia secondary to Parkinson's. But dystonia occurs out in its own right as well. Uh, what it is is involuntary muscle spasm. So just look at me here for a minute. If I want to move my hand down, the muscles of my, the under part of my forearm pull, and the ones on top relax. Muscles pull, that's how they do work. They pull from the different bones that their uh, joints they're associated with together, contract. So if I want to move my hand down voluntarily, using the not the base of the pathway here at least, I, I, my brain, you know, it sends the signal when my hand turns down. Well, in dystonia, what we have is the muscles pulling on both sides, and you have an abnormal position, an abnormal posture. One set of muscles usually dominates. In this case, and in my patient's example, muscles on the right, part of his neck on the back. Uh, let's see which side was going to. 
Left. Muscles on the left side on the back and the sternocleidomastoid on the front of the neck. Usually they're under voluntary control, but in dystonia, the voluntary control is lost. It's involuntary muscle spasm develops. It can affect any part of the body that has voluntary muscle, not the bowels. The bowels are involuntary muscles, they move on their own. But uh, skeletal muscle, uh, certainly facial muscles, neck muscles are commonly affected. The neck is the most common affected condition. And this is the condition that you have just shown you, cervical dystonia. I've shown you a very dramatic case of it. A lot of people are walking around out there with neck pain and head twisted to the side and they think they just have a muscle strain. It's a very, very underdiagnosed condition amongst general medical practitioners, and even neurologists will sometimes miss this. Rider's cramp, you've heard of rider's cramp. What that is is a form of focal dystonia effect in the arms. And musicians can even develop musicians' dystonia while playing musical instruments. It's not that common in pain, playing the piano, Leonard Fleischmann, um, and uh, other uh, stars kind of at the peak of their performance. Uh, uh, they develop this abnormal spasm. The yips, who are any golfers out here? Have you heard of the yips? The yips is something that you get in your body or chipping an abnormal muscle spasm. It's a form of dystonia as well, very hard to treat. Um, so again, specific part of the body is often affected for a focal dystonia, and then the general part of the body can also be affected. This is patient of mine that we did DBS on. And uh, here, she's kind of trying to move her hand to grab this folder. There's involuntary muscle spasm. She's trying to kind of work it out. Uh, she actually worked in a, a pub in Wisconsin. It's a major job in Wisconsin. There's lots of pubs. <laughs> but she's a really, really wonderful uh, woman that I worked with for a number of years. And here, her right foot, so right arm leg, and she developed it on her left side as well. And uh, did Botox injections for years, uh, pushing the dose higher and higher. She's saying she can't. Do you have a trick to relax it? No. And at rest, if she's relaxed, it's not too bad, but when she tries to move, it worsens. And that's the characteristic of dysonia. At rest, it's relaxed. Body's not being moved, and then when the body's being moved for specific tasks, the muscle spasm worsens. So best at rest may worse by movement or activity. And I don't have a post-DBS video on her, but she was amazing. She actually was on disability for 18 months and then went back to work after we did DBS. This is a young guy I treated for years who has a, a dystonic tremor. So a simple tremor, Parkinson's dysonia, sometimes it's hard to separate them out. Just hold your hands together but not touching. There you go. So you can have a side view of your hand there. He had this for a number of years. But guess when he came in for treatment? When he got his driver's license mm -hmm. and wanted to drive. More difficult. How much he was worried about the fact he was driving. And then bend your elbows. That he couldn't drink or use his left hand for much else wasn't really a concern for this young kid. He wanted to drive. wonderful with Botox injections and uh, so far hasn't had to, to go for DBS but just to show you that it can affect the neck, the limbs, the hands, arms with a tremor, and even the face, neck. Patient for cranial cervical dystonia and face syndrome, we call it. We like to see if there's any movement in your Crossing and help stop that movement. So excessive blinking, excessive jaw movement, head movement, neck spasm. And she was treated with Botox and some oral medication. So tremor may be present with dystonia. And the initial uh, uh, observation of tremor by a general practitioner or a general neurologist might lead someone to think it's Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. Uh, tremor and dystonia is usually more jerky and irregular, whereas an essential tremor in Parkinson's, there's a rhythm to it. It's very rhythmic. You can measure it with electrodes on the skin. 
But again, the, the key feature here is that normal position or posture of a body part involved. It can be painful. It's usually better with rest and worse with action. Isolated head tremor or head tremor, much worse than head than hand tremor is almost always dystonia. Some people are diagnosed with essential tremor that actually have dystonia. It's pretty common. It's, it's, it's probably more common that they'll be diagnosed with, uh, incorrectly with essential tremor when in fact a, a shaky head, uh, much worse than the hands, is, is, a, is cervical dystonia. The treatment is very different. It's important to have a correct diagnosis. So how do we treat dystonia? Well, for, for mild dystonia, just getting the diagnosis, knowing one for one, you're not crazy, that your body really is doing something on its own. Um, for the first uh, part of the 20th century, dystonia was considered a psychiatric condition. These videos I was just showing you, doctors thought that they were psychiatric problems. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which, you know, it sounds like, oh, you know, well, those morons thinking. No, but, but there are some good reasons for it. And one, one of the things is this uh, condition called, or this aspect called just antagonist as a sensory trait. So many people with cervical dystonia, their head will pull over and put by putting that, and they can't move it back to the other side, for example, but by putting the, the hand to the chin, they're able to freely move the head. I have people with jaws in dystonia whose jaws are long, and then they put a toothpick between their teeth and are able to speak very clearly as long as they hold their toothpick between their teeth. It's pretty bizarre. So, you know, before our understanding of this and the anatomy and many of the case reports of people with dystonia having abnormalities in part of the brain sometimes came about, you know, it was considered psychiatric and they were getting psychiatric, psychiatric meds, which often made them worse. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, however, uh, you know, for mild dystonia, I pointed out the patients I talked about treatment options all the way from just watching and waiting therapy uh, to uh, more advanced treatments. Uh, but PT, OT, or key, uh, key uh, people to manage uh, the dystonia, uh, speech therapy as well. The sensory integration techniques um, are, are key also kind of body awareness, knowing how to maximize the use of sensory tricks. For mild to moderate dystonia, Botox is actually the FDA approved first line indicated treatment. It's one of the few things that, that the FDA says you should act, doctors, you should first do Botox for um, a mild to moderate dystonia, particularly cervical dystonia. The American Academy of Neurology has as their guidelines that Botox is the first recommended treatment above medication, oral medication, and other things. I have here listed some medications, artine, amantine, clonazepam, gabapentin, baclofen, levodopa, zinazine. Many of them are used to treat Parkinson's disease. Some of them uh, increase dopamine, some of them block dopamine. Uh, this should give you an idea that there is some neurochemicals involved, that dopamine is part, definitely part of that. And it's not necessarily an oversupply or undersupply all the time, more than it's a balance of dopamine uh, and other chemicals within the brain, like a cervical. For moderate to severe dystonia, many of the videos I've shown you are those, the ones that are worth video worthy. Um, the same treatments are used for mild to, to moderate, um, except deep brain stimulation, or moderate to severe, except for uh, uh, deep brain stimulation. Uh, it's being added on for globus pallidus, uh, even other locations in the brain, subthalamic nucleus, thalamus. Now, new Medtronic DBS therapy has revolutionized the way that we treat dystonia with DBS. And in the past, we've not done a lot of DBS for, for dystonia because uh, in, in, in practicality, it's sort of hard to make the kind of adjustments that make this treatment the, the most, most useful. But new therapy that Medtronic has developed, new technologies allow us to do a bit more. Uh, we use uh, changes in voltage, allowing the patients, after we make a couple of settings, to adjust the voltage on their own and using different groups. I'm going to explain what this is, just very kind of bird's eye view. Um, so, so for dystonia, for Parkinson's disease and central tremor, we do stimulation changes and change the DBS right there in clinic. You see immediate changes, often, dramatic changes. Really rewarding, very cool. Uh, for dystonia, it's different. You can see some uh, changes initially, but you see more changes sometimes the longer it's left in on a certain study, so long as the patient tolerates it. And to do that, you, know, you can't live in clinic. Uh, our office isn't that big, um, but uh, you, you can you know, go home with the device having different abilities to set it to increase or decrease the voltage and make these changes, wait a week, make more changes, wait a week, make more changes, kind of on, on their own, the patients, as they're guided by their practitioners, are able to make controlled, careful changes that won't cause them any harm and can actually get better results with dystonia than we were able to do in the past. So, 
New PPS units give patients control. This is an example. This is just kind of, I just made up these numbers, but this is very similar to what we'll see. And Jamie can maybe tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, for example, group B, what this is, is group A, B, C, and D, these are different programs. And at any given time, a patient can select a group A program that Jamie or I sets up in clinic. We program, we know it's safe. They can activate that and deactivate one of the other ones, B. You can activate C and deactivate D. And go back to A and kind of have programs that are preset where different areas of the brain are actually targeted for, for different types of results. And in dystonia, being able to switch over and over again over several weeks in time to, to set it and wait a week or two to see how it works throughout your, your daily schedule, that's a very powerful effect of the uh, Medtronic DBS technology. So uh, for dystonia, I think it's very relevant. And, and for uh, essential tumor and Parkinson's, we use it too. It's just that for dystonia, I think it's end up, gonna end up being a game changer for uh, allowing more and more patients to get a really good benefit with the, the deep brain stimulation therapy. And, and again, just some of the parameters here, case positive, one negative. These, when you see the negative numbers here, one negative, two negative, one negative. Uh, these are different areas uh, along the lead that's inserted into the brain, activating, literally activating a higher area within the brain, a lower area, you know, an in-between area. So literally activating different areas of the brain that we can test in clinic that we allow you, the patients, to go home and adjust yourself. This all this all this already been tested and known to be safe, but you can, can make these changes to have more control to really try and find out what fits, fits you best. A couple more videos. This is a young kid with dystonia. This is generalized affecting the whole body. This form of dystonia is not that common, but we do see it. experience with brain stimulation at, at, on the whole, uh, we, we're using more and more for focal dystonias, the neck dystonias, the, the severe limb dystonias. So it's gone from a situation where we only used it in the most severe cases of general dystonia. And this young lady's got more of a cervical dystonia, segment or arm in her neck. It's gone from being used only in the most severe forms of dystonia to more moderate forms of cervical dystonia and other other forms of uh, focal dystonia. Can you get a finger attached to my finger? Touch your nose. 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 Touch your That's the more part. So who does what for a DBS or go? Why do you have to see so many providers and have all these appointments? Well, we want to have good outcomes. I mean, ultimately, you know, whatever I think about how a patient's done from surgery, if, they're, if they say a year, a year after the surgery that they would do it all again, uh, bottom line, it was the right thing to do. Um, I'm a movement disorders neurologist. I have special training in, in Parkinson's diagnosis, all these conditions diagnosis. Um, and I, I hope I've kind of shown you a bit how it can be a little complex to, to separate the different conditions out. But to get the correct diagnosis, uh, manage medication, coordinate therapy, physical therapy, speech, OT, uh, select the patient and the brain site for surgery, program and adjust the DBS device. Jamie Martin, who you're uh, here next, our nurse practitioner, uh, specializes in movement disorders, also assists with pre-surgical testing, uh, helps manage uh, the patient, uh, educates the patient, and adjusts the DBS device and medication um, after the procedure is performed often to, to minimize the use of medications that were sometimes used in large amounts causing side effects. And then our new movement disorders neurosurgeon, Dr. Hirschauer and Dr. Carlson, are very fortunate here to have two world-class uh, neurosurgeons. One of the reasons I, I came here was because of uh, uh, these guys and, and knowing Dr. Carlson from previously, knowing the, the quality of work that he does and how extremely compulsive he can be in a good way. I'll never let him. 
The other members of our DBS team that are very important are a psychometrist that do neuropsychiatric testing or neurofax tests that we do in North Northwest Neurological. Uh, sometimes we send out uh, for more detailed neuropsychiatric testing. Our therapists are uh, the ones who work within the community, whether it's home therapy or uh, uh, St. Luke's or other uh, centers, uh, measure balance and function, uh, the arms, uh, legs, speech. Uh, and our support staff, they give advice over the phone and answer questions. And our patients often end up talking to these guys more than you us. And of course, there's the beloved Homer, if any of you have met Homer. And uh, some are our uh, new medical assistant, uh, Megan, that help with scheduling. These are actually key, key people. Uh, they don't uh, directly uh, do clinical care. Well, Homer, maybe, a little bit. Um, Dr. Homer, as we call him. Um, but uh, they're, they're really key parts uh, in making the overall DBS process work well for our patients. So what's the evidence? Well, for Parkinson's, when meds are kicking uh, in and wearing off, we know that deep brain stimulation and medication for Parkinson's work better together than either of them do alone for people who are getting a good response with medicines are kicking in and wearing off. We have the evidence for randomized controlled trials, experimental trials, patients and doctors didn't know what was happening, what treatment the patient was getting, just how they rated them, how they measured them. So the best quality trials that we can do, we know that we have objective hard evidence showing that deep brain stimulation is, is very effective. Uh, we know that long-term, recent evidence has come out showing that long-term benefits and quality of life we're seeing. And there's better quality of life if the pre is done earlier compared to later. Why is this? Well, it really comes down to having more good years. And it's definitely driven by the improvement in movement, okay? But the better quality of life and the caregivers also have better quality of life too. Now, this isn't mean, meant to say that you should have deep brain stimulation at the time of diagnosis. I don't mean er earlier in that sense. But, but you, the, the current FDA label basically, it says it's for, deep, for, for Parkinson's uh, patients who are getting good response to meds, meds kicking and wearing off, and have had Parkinson's for about five years, at least five years. Now, in practicality, in most of the trials for DBS, the patients had Parkinson's for 10 or 15 years. And even in our own practice, where you know, we, we are, I think we're a really very advanced practice, and our patient groups are, are pretty well educated. Even then, we, we see that, that the average of DBS uh, patient with Parkinson's has probably had the condition at least 10 years sometimes. Uh, sometimes earlier, uh, but, uh, but often, and traditionally, it's been later. Uh, and that's something that we, I think we have to think about now that we have more and more safety data about uh, deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's than we have our own surgical safety data here. The risk of infection and severe disability from deep brain stimulation is very low. Dr. Carlson will talk a lot more about that in our experience here. Certainly this happens, and if you're at a center where you do lots of these procedures, you will have infections. It just happens. Even, even with uh, the best possible uh, uh, operating technique and ORs and such, if, if you are at a center that does a few, you may not have any, or you may rarely have one, but, but we, you know, we have a couple occasionally because we just do a lot of cases here. However, if that happens, it's easily treatable. The unit sometimes has to be taken out, give antibiotics, and most people with Parkinson's will want the unit put back in as quickly as possible. For essential tremor, we know that the long-term use of DBS for essential tremor shows exceptional results. There are times that the, the tremor will break through even DBS, and uh, there'll be significant tremor after having DBS done. But even in those patients, if you turn the DBS on, it goes, if you turn the DBS off, it goes from being maybe moderate to horribly severe. Uh, so, you know, there's still a clear effect of DBS even when the tremor breaks through, which is, is not that common. Uh, the, the free central tremor, I think for you all, the key thing I'd like you to know is uh, the ability to adjust deep brain stimulator is a clear advantage in my mind compared to these other treatments. Uh, thalamotomy, gamma knife, ultrasound, they, they, they work through different ways, but the, the end result is burning a hole in the brain. This is back to Scribonius largus and the torpedo fish. Right? I mean, it's kind of Roman. Um, but it's done, and there are patients that, that actually where it's more appropriate. If a person's very frail and, and they're not a good operative candidate, they, they can't you know, go through even minor procedures without much risk or have lots of bleeding risk, uh, this might be more appropriate. Um, if they have uh, you know, other uh, severe medical problems that might contraindicate them from what's usually not a terribly taxing surgical procedure, then, then, then I, I've actually advocated for, for these treatments over DBS in those rare circumstances and we kind of encourage patients. But the vast majority of time, uh, my, my first choice is still the deep brain stimulation uh, procedure. Sometimes I've done this, I don't know if Dr. Carlson's done it. Um, I, I've, I've had a patient uh, who had a uh, gamma knife uh, treatment whose uh, central tremor went on to break through that 
was sent to, to this one in Wisconsin and was sent to, to Mayo and they refused to do the surgery. We went, we went ahead and did the surgery, put in the electrode over the gamma knife spot um, and uh, had amazing results. Absolutely amazing results. I don't advocate for that. I, I think that, that that's something that was not very well studied. We don't know the results of, of the, that those results would always hold. Whereas the opposite, I think you, know, you could always take the DBS out and do something else afterwards. So overall, just DBS in the good years for any of these conditions. Far too many people delay deep brain stimulation beyond the window of opportunity who later come to me and ask for the procedure. I see this all the time. Wait until their health declines or there's new or unexpected health problems and they're less ideal candidates then. The Parkinson's progresses with symptoms that don't respond well to medication. Again, I don't, don't part, medicine's always helping Parkinson's, but, but the, the, the degree of their effect is less, it's not as robust, and therefore the degree of the DBS effect is not going to be as large. Essential trauma progresses, but one thing about essential trauma I didn't mention is the older you are, the more likely you are to develop essential trauma, and as you age, you get more medical problems, the worse the tremor's likely to become. Likely to become. So a person with essential tremor who's in their, their 70s, and has maybe moderate tremor, and you know, they don't want a surgical procedure, they're reasonable, they don't, they're not jumping into it, but they've got you know, some mild kidney disease and maybe mild heart disease. Well, five years later, they may have significant kidney disease and maybe had a couple of moderate heart attacks or two. They may not be a, as, as good of a candidate for the surgery if they're very medically unstable, and for those people, we, we you know, would have preferred to have done that earlier rather than later, so you do kind of have to put that in perspective realizing that the older you get, the more problems you have, not the fewer. So, um, dystonia may be present for so long that the muscles stiffen and turn to fiber. Certainly if a person's head is in a certain position for a very long period of time, the muscles change their physical quality, they become very different. Uh, fixed postures, postures where you can't get free movement, typically don't respond as well to EBS. And, and uh, I've done them, but, but they're, they're, the outcomes are not as good as if uh, it's caught early on and they still have better range of motion. Who here knows what Tourette syndrome is? Who here uh, knows that you can do deep brain stimulation for Tourette syndrome? Now you do. So this is a childhood onset movement disorder. Most kids grow out of it by the time they're 12. Uh, some will continue with symptoms. It's extremely disabling for those when it continues. This is a patient of mine, and actually, uh, this patient was on a very high dose of medication. The, the, the AD technologist labeled it with uh, uh, no meds because it looks so bad. So this is the first visit on meds, high dose antipsychotics, which is what we use to treat Tourette's. Suppress the movements and threats, you can somewhat suppress the severe movements. It, it took me 
about uh, three months getting to this state with programming business every two weeks or so. I had to cut his control off because he was such an intelligent guy. He was kind of getting into a little bit of trouble with some of the adjustments he was making. So he was cut off. <laughs> so you're going to touch my finger. Same here? Yeah. And then touch your nose. Finger. You know, he is suppressing movements of it here. Uh, so they do come out more. And one of the interesting things here is that he told me that, you know, Doc, I think the way this, for me, this is working is that the DBS isn't a directly suppressing the movements, but it's allowing me to suppress them much better with that with almost no effort. We did some other psychological kind of training called habit reversal therapy and some other ways to kind of help channel states in more acceptable forms. But this was just a, for this guy, is just a game changer. And then I'm just one at a time, and place your hands on your lap. You're taking control of y'all. He's taking control of So I'm having to focus on being quiet when I'm in the theater. Um, and what was the other goal with that last time? I was, was going to talk about his quality of life here just a little bit. Your goals. I, I went to a movie that was good. I was able to focus on the movie as well, um, rather than having to focus on being quiet when in the theater. Um, and what was the other goal that last time? It was so important to me, obviously. Oh, uh, I have registered for a class this fall. I'm going to be taking and go to Java. Um, so I met both my goals from last time. Talk a lot about goal setting and interests and uh, sense of humor once again. So he's a pretty happy guy. Um, and uh, you know, very rewarding again just to kind of talk about the, the all the you know, this is kind of version on psychosurgery and psychiatric conditions, so it's threat does kind of straddle both neurological and psychiatric disciplines. He was referred to by a psychiatrist who was at her wits and so that's uh, really all I had for my presentation uh, today. I didn't actually, beforehand, I meant to, to thank the Sacred Heart Foundation, who, uh, through a generous grant, made all this possible. So I uh, very much wanted to thank them. I just forgot earlier. So very, so appreciate the Sacred Heart Foundation's support of this uh, event today, our talk. Uh, to schedule a consult or a second opinion at Northwest Neurological, there's our number. No need to refer. We have, uh, accept almost all insurances. Uh, look, to learn more, look uh, at the Parkinson's Resource Center based out of Spokane here. It covers the entire inland northwest area. SpokaneParkinson's.org, uh, the Sony Medical Research Foundation. Uh, there is a great Estonia support group here in Spokane as well, and the International Essential Care Foundation. So I think uh, what we'll do is go ahead and hold questions for now and uh, uh, let Dr. Pra, uh, did Jamie be on that? So, okay. Let's take a break. Oh, yeah. You give a guy an hour and he takes an hour and a half. <laughs> well, let's take a 10 minute break, but the better part is coming. <laughs>
I can keep it. I thought you said you needed it. Thank you. 
There's a little spot in up there. Not the whole thing. Wait till we're done with this side of the Most of the time. Yeah, I'm a nurse. 
research. He's a neurologist. Yeah, no, we're not related. We know each other. Yeah, just because we're in the same profession and very nice. Yeah, we always people get us confused, especially when I moved to town and he's been here for a long time. I was like, what? What? I could be. Uh, Maybe I just look out. I'm not that, I'm not that guy. <laughs> okay, let's get rolling. So, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Jonathan Carlson. I'm a neurosurgeon. I've been in Spokane for almost seven years and doing deep brain stimulation during that time. And this is one of my very favorite things to do. In, in, in the realm of neurosurgery, there's not a lot of things I can do to fix people. Most of what I take care of is neurosurgeons, somebody with a bad brain injury in a car wreck or a bad brain tumor. But deep brain stimulation is a therapy that makes people better. It fixes or improves their neurologic symptoms. And so that's why it's such a fun treatment. It's fun because the surgery's fun, and it's also fun because you as a group of people are kind of special. You have, uh, you're every one of you that came here today have kind of self-selected yourself out of the population. You're interested and you're proactive about your disease, which means you're gonna do well with your disease. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about DBS, uh, and then we're gonna get some patients up here. Jamie Mark is gonna talk about the DBS. And what's already kind of been discussed is Dr. Aldridge giving you a background about the diagnosis and some of the medicine management. But I'm just going to talk about surgery. And my talk is basically oriented to if you came to my office today and we sat down and I examined you and you want to know about surgery. What's involved in it? What are the risks? And is it going to work for me? That's what I'm going to talk about. Now, this is a little tricky because I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease and essential tremor at the same time. So I'm going to kind of be flipping back and forth. So we'll see how it goes. Usually I have just all central tremor or just all Parkinson's. This is the first time we've gotten everybody together. So hopefully all of you with Parkinson's can see the t folks and the t folks You guys can intermingle. This is like you know a Scandinavian get together. You've got Norwegians on one side and the Swedes on the other. Okay, you guys, it's okay to talk. All right, what is DBS? DBS is a therapy. All right, it's a complicated therapy. It involves a medical device. This is what the device looks like. It's got a battery pack. It's got a bunch of names for this, a generator. This sits under the clavicle. And it stimulates the brain tissue. It stimulates through this little wire. And the wire has to get put in the right spot in the brain for it to work. And there's several different locations. And when we talk about surgery, what we're doing is talking about placing this wire into the brain. Right? And then there's a connector wire that hooks the two together. And uh, uh, let's start passing some of the stuff around you guys can feel it. You know, speech class in college says, bring a prop. <laughs> so thanks to all our Medtronics guys, we got some props. These are these aren't the real thing. Well, one or two of these are some of these are models, so they don't really look very real. So that's the device. This is, not, uh, this is not experimental, like Dr. Aldridge said. This equipment's been around, this technique, this surgery's been around for almost 20 years. And there's many research studies, randomized prospective research that shows it's a good therapy, okay? It's not a hoax, but it's also not perfect, okay? And we're gonna kind of talk about what this surgery will do to help your symptoms and what it won't help, because it doesn't fix everything. Who wouldn't want some awesome electronics in their body? Right. This, this is what the, this is an x-ray of the batteries. I don't usually put the batteries right here. I put them in a better spot. This isn't my picture. But you can see inside the device here, there's a giant battery, which is most of what the volume is. And there's a bunch of electronics and connections and stuff. And you know, what's inside this device is very sophisticated and it takes it takes millions and millions of dollars to develop this technology. This is not just the guy in the, in the garage who said, I know what I'm going to do today. This is a very complicated process. It costs the company millions of dollars to get it FDA approved. And it's pretty cool. We'll show you what it does. 
Okay, question, you're probably wondering, what is DBS gonna do for me? Okay, well, the answer to that question depends on several things, and these are the factors. It depends on your disease, obviously, central channel versus Parkinson, but it also depends on your subtype of Parkinson's disease. We're gonna go through that in a minute. Uh, and it depends on what stage you are in your Parkinson's disease, because it has different effects as the disease progresses. So let's talk about the flavors of Parkinson's. Uh, this is not a neurologist approved slide. <laughs> Dr. Aldrin probably has a better un understanding of this, but as a simple surgeon that sees lots of Parkinson's patients, I think of your disease kind of into four categories. And the reason this is helpful is because the surgical outcome is different depending on which of these kind of types of Parkinson's you've got. And that's why this is valuable, okay? So the typical Parkinson's, uh, it starts with one side, it starts with tremor usually, and then it becomes stiff and rigid, sometimes small handwriting, and after four or five years or less, the other hand gets affected. These folks, this is probably 80% Parkinson's patients. This responds well to medications. The tremor goes away when you take your pills. Uh, and then the disease progresses, and eventually you develop gait and postural problems after 10 or 15 years. Okay, this is the typical Parkinson's. There's a couple exceptions to this. One is tremor dominant. And this is the patient who has just tremor. It's usually moderate to severe. And they don't develop a lot of stiffness, slowness, and balance problems for a long time. And the Parkinson's meds, the dopamine meds, don't work very well for the tremor. And some of these folks can't even take them. They get nauseated. They just don't tolerate cinematic or dopamine agonists. They just they, they don't feel good. Uh, the reason this is a special group is because the surgery is a very good therapy for these folks. Because the medicines don't really work. And the surgery is great for tremor. Okay, another group of patients are young onset Parkinson's. That's probably a better term. Juvenile makes you think you're a delinquent or something. But um, juvenile means young onset. And the age here is 55, you know, maybe 60, sort of. Uh, what's important about this group is that uh, they're a small group, but they're young, they're healthy. They're usually pretty active still. They don't have a lot of medical conditions, okay, which makes them a little different than some of these folks. And when they take the cinnamon, it doesn't take them very long to get dyskinesia. And often, dyskinesia becomes their major problem. It's not even their Parkinson's disease to begin with. It's the side effects of the medicine, the ups and downs, on-off times, and the severe dyskinesia. And the reason this is important to identify is that these folks do really well in surgery also because we can eliminate the dyskinesia and we can improve the motor fluctuations. Okay. So then I've left one other category. This is called the akinetic rigid Parkinson's. So this is the, the patient or the person who never really has any tremor. They start out with slowness and stiffness. And it usually goes unrecognized for several years because they don't have tremor. So the regular doctor says, well, I don't know, it doesn't look like Parkinson's to me. And they don't get diagnosed. And so they tend to fall into the neurology clinic a little bit later in their disease. And so they kind of look like they have a faster disease progression because stiffness and slowness and gait problems develop earlier in these folks. Gait problems and slowness are some of the symptoms that the stimulator helps but not as much as things like tremor and dyskinesia. So these folks do well with the surgery. They do have benefit, but they don't look as awesome as some of the other patients do. So first thing you got to think about is what category are you? And then the next thing to consider when, when you're deciding whether or not to have surgery is where are you in your disease, OK? This is a, a concept, and then everybody's got a little different curve here. All right, but the, the idea is what's important. Uh, you know, Parkinson's kind of goes through these different stages, and I can see all these stages out. I can see them here, just in the audience. Probably not the honeymoon phase, because I doubt those folks are here. But all of you, when you got diagnosed with Parkinson's, you know, there was initially some denial, like it was really mild, I don't think I had it, right? And then you take the medicines, and it's like, oh, God, I feel so much better. The medicines work really well. This uh, pre-diagnosis and honeymoon or early phase, you, know, you look normal and you're taking your pills. And people at the grocery store wouldn't know you have Parkinson's. Okay. And some people, that can last for years. 
But some people, this is a short period, six months, a year. Sometimes it's short. And eventually you develop moderate Parkinson's. This is where most people sit most of the time. Moderate Parkinson's means you're taking your medicines, they work, they make you better, but you know, people in church realize that you've got Parkinson's. It's obvious, you can see it. The medicines don't make you quite normal. Eventually, those medications start to give you problems. And there's two problems or two side effects to develop. Dyskinesia and motor fluctuations. So dis we saw a video of a guy with dyskinesia. I mean, it can be really severe, but usually it's mild. And a lot of patients don't even realize they're doing it. You know, they move their arm, and they move their, their arm a little faster than their arm or something. Dyskinesia is usually related to peak dose of medicine. So when you take your cinnamon half an hour to an hour later, you start to get a little dyskinetic. Most people like dyskinesia because that's when they can move. But when it gets severe, it can become disabled. And that's a good indication for surgical treatment when you get the motor fluctuations. The off time is a little harder to understand if you've never had it. When you take your pills, they kick in, they get absorbed, you feel better, you do better for a few hours, and then the pills start to wear off. Oh, where's my next dose? Okay. That's called wearing off and or off time. And sometimes that can become a huge problem. And up, people end up in these cycles, like a roller coaster. They're either dyskinetic or the medicines wear off and then they're stuck. That being stuck is an off time. Okay. The surgery helps the off time. So everybody kind of goes through these different stages of the disease. Uh, it has an impact on what you look like. I guess I didn't talk about the end stage. Nobody wants to talk about that. But eventually, People with really advanced Parkinson's disease have problems walking and balance and falls, and, we, and then they get in a wheelchair, and they need a lot of help at home. Okay? That's what I consider late stage as a better term, I guess. I'm like juvenile late stage, I don't know. Late stage. This, folks who are down in this category don't get a lot of benefits. We tend, we tend to not offer surgical treatment to somebody who's in a nursing home or is so disabled they can't feed themselves. Because what we want to do is restore function and keep people active in your regular living at home and regular activities. So when do we want to intervene? That's what these yellow lines here are. If we do surgery when your disease is moderate, we tend to push you back three or four years in terms of your symptoms. Like if, if you've had Parkinson's for eight years, and if you're starting to get motor fluctuations and you're suddenly, you're just a lot worse, that's probably the very best time to consider surgery because we can reduce your off time, we can stop your dyskinesia, and we push you back up that curve several years. That's the typical patient that does it very well. Uh, if we intervene when you're really advanced, yeah, we can push you back up the curve, but it's probably not as far, not as much of an improvement. A lot of surgeons and particularly neurologists have conjectured as to what happens to the Parkinson's disease when you have surgery. And I think probably the consensus at this point is that your Parkinson's disease continues at the same rate of progression whether or not you have the surgery. That's one of the most common questions I get. And we're going to do question and answers eventually. Uh, the disease still progresses and the symptoms that the surgery doesn't help continue to get worse. The symptoms that the surgery helps are stable for years and years and years. Okay. So what does it help? A uh, huge impact is on dyskinesia. We can basically eliminate dyskinesia by reducing the dose of medications. So you never get enough medications to get the dyskinesia. Okay. Uh, off time reduction. Lots of research on reducing the off time is probably about a 50% reduction in the amount of time that you're off in the day. So if you spend three hours a day off, you can only do an hour and a half. And the severity of the off is improved as well. So you're not as bad off as you are in your off state. Tremor elimination in Parkinson's is, is very good in most patients. It's not 100%, but it's very good. If tremor is one of your major problems in Parkinson's, then it's a really good treatment for that. These are the best three improvements that we get from the treatment. Uh, patients tend to take less medicines, less frequently. So if you've got 20 pills in your box, you're taking every two and a half hours. The surgery is going to help the complexity of the medications, which kind of makes your day a little bit easier. 
The other things it helps is stiffness, slowness, and posture. And it helps the shuffling gait. You know, a bunch of studies on you know, activities of daily living. Nobody knows what that is. But activities of daily living are buttoning your shirt, taking a shower, eating food, drinking out of a cup, really just basic things that with Parkinson's can become a challenge. It's to be slow. You know, people have problems buttoning their shirts. Those things tend to get a little bit better. Lots of studies on that. Now, what does it not help? It does not help get freezing. Anybody have gate freezing want to demonstrate for us? Okay, I'll just, this is gate freezing. So this is shuffling gate, right? And this is gate freezing. You're walking along and you come to a doorway. And that's gate freezing, okay? So I don't know why, but the surgery just tends not to help that very much, okay? Um, quiet voice, hypophonia. The other part of this is dysarthria. So you, some, some folks tend to talk on the phone and they, they give you four or five words really fast and then they pause. Or you can't hear them on the phone and everybody's saying, what, what? You know, that quiet voice, surgery doesn't help that much. Um, if you have really bad swallowing problems from the phone, it's not gonna get better. That might get a little bit worse. It does not make you any smarter. <laughs> It doesn't make any dumb either. There was a lot of concern in the early, early years of the street that we were making people's cognitive function decline. And there's a lot of research on that. And the only thing that consistently gets worse is the speed of language processing. So there may be a small impact on how well you think, but it's very mild. It does not cause dementia. And it doesn't fix your depression. Some people have these really high expectations of surgery and, and they're never met because they're too high and then they get more depressed after surgery because they kind of imagine this is the solution to everything and then they get depressed because it didn't fix them 100%. So it clearly does not fix mood. It doesn't make you more depressed. It doesn't fix your depression. Okay, that was Parkinson's. Let's talk about essential tremor. Essential tremor is a disease where there's really not a lot of good medication. I mean, the beta blockers for analog, all those, um, primidone, sometimes some of the anti-seizure medicines, they help the tremor, but there's not really a good medicine treatment for this, especially when the tremor is disabled. You can't drink, can't write. The surgery is fantastic for, these, for essential tremor that's disabled. It is the most exciting thing there is in that surgery. I'm convinced of it because it's instantaneous. And we've got Don Polk here today. He's got he's a gentleman with essential tremor. He's going to turn his system on and off. And you can see it's, it looks like a party trick. Okay? Um, we don't treat mild essential tremor because there's risk with the surgery. And if you have a problem and your tremor is mild, well, then we make it worse. Okay? But when you're, when you're Activities of life are impacted to the point where you can't function to where you want to. That's when surgery is an option for you. Okay? Writing, eating, dressing, talking, voice tremor. Okay? So in general, the contraindications for surgery, and this, this really kind of applies to both central tremor and Parkinson's, is, are the following. Dementia. If you've got Alzheimer's disease as well as Parkinson's, or Alzheimer's and essential tremor, we're not going to we're not going to do surgery because the Alzheimer's ultimately is going to become your big problem. Okay. And we go through a lot of testing to screen you and make sure that you don't have dementia. Okay. And that's that's kind of our responsibility. I'm going to show you a flow chart that's very complicated about all the steps to go through to get the surgery. One of them is cognitive testing because we want to make sure you don't have dementia. Severe medical disability. I take care of a lot of very sick patients with all kinds of medical problems. And we tend to, if you've got enormous severe advanced medical issues, severe heart disease, and severe diabetes, severe hypertension, and you've had strokes, and you're really disabled from all your medical conditions, we probably, you know, sometimes we'll try, but we tend not to operate on those folks. There's no age limit for this treatment. In other words, if you're over 85, I'm not gonna say, no, I've done surgery with people just over 85. But they're really healthy 85-year-olds. They're living independently, they're doing well. There's people who are 60 that are too sick to have surgery. 
So there's not a numerical age limit. There's a physical age limit, okay? Basically your medical status. Um, things that people are worried about, they think might be contraindications or not. We can do your surgery if you have a heart pacemaker, okay? It does not interact with the heart. It makes the surgery a little bit trickier, but it's, you're still able to do it if you have a pacemaker. If you're on Coumadin for atrial fibrillation or whatever other reason, we can still do your surgery. Just a little bit more complicated, but we still do. Um, like I said, age is not an exclusion. Way back when these studies were started 20 years ago, you had to be basically under 60 years old. Now we know it works regardless of age. Okay, for essential tremor, the location that we put the wire is different than for Parkinson's. All these locations are within about a centimeter of each other, but they're different anatomical structures in the brain that have different connections inside the brain tissue. And so for central tremor, the typical part of the surgery is identical. It doesn't matter if it's Parkinson's or central tremor. The only difference is where I put the wire in the brain. And then the other difference is how we manage you after the surgery. Okay? But the actual part of doing the surgery is almost the same. In essential tremor, we put it in this special structure called the ventral lateral nucleus of the thalamus, which is the location in the deep part of your brain where the motor system maps through. So where you move your hand, where that maps through, that's called the thalamus. Okay. For Parkinson's, we put it in the subthalamic nucleus right here. Right? That's about a half a centimeter away. And then the other place we put it, which is not on this picture, is in the globus pallus internus. And that's for Parkinson's and dystonia. Okay. This surgery has risks with it. It's not benign. And all of you should understand this completely before you decide to have surgery. Okay. And these are the risks. Before I go into the specific details, you know, most people go for the surgery and they don't have any problems. But infection is the big problem in this. Yeah, we did an analysis last year. We did uh, 135 DBS procedures. I think that was our number. And we had an infection rate of about 3%. A lot of research studies have shown public published their infection rates like 10%, 12%. So our infection rate is good, but we still get infections. And they're the bane of my existence. When we get an infection, it's a fixable problem. But we have to operate, take the equipment out, and put you on antibiotics for a while. And if it was working, in a few months, we come back and put it back in. So it's fixable. But if you get an infection, then you got a bunch of more treatment you have to go through. Infection is the most common problem we have. Uh, the problem I'm very worried about every time I do surgery is a brain hemorrhage. This is basically a stroke. Most hemorrhages are small. They're a few millimeters, and they happen just around the wire, either on the surface of the brain or down deep in the brain. Most of the time, we see a little hemorrhage on a post-operative MRI, and patients don't even have any symptoms. But these hemorrhages can grow, and they can get big, and there is actually a death risk associated with this. Probably around two or three out of a thousand patients. And those deaths are because of a giant hemorrhage, and a family decides, no, we don't want to do any interventions. If you have a giant hemorrhage, I can go take it out, and you'll live, but you'll have a stroke. And that's what nobody wants to have, right? Nobody wants to live with paralysis or disability. Those events are, they are rare. If you're worried about that and you can't, you can't cope with the concept of the concern that I might have a stroke, then you shouldn't have surgery. But I'm not worried about it very much. It doesn't happen very often. Okay. Those are the two big deals. Uh, I've had patients with heart attacks after surgery. We try to make sure you, your heart's okay, but you all are in that age group where you can have a heart attack. Um, haven't had one in surgery, but the event rate is around 3%. Now, when we turn the stimulator on, we're stimulating the brain tissue with electricity. Right? All of you have put a nine volt battery in your time. Right, you test, is this a new battery or old one, right? You pull the drawer out, uh oh. Well, that, that kind of shocking sensation is very similar to what people feel when we turn the stimulator on the brain. Okay. And that electricity can spread to areas of the brain that cause side effects. The tingling can bother you. It can stimulate the speech areas that control your tongue and give you speech problems or dysarthria. Uh, and so Jamie's going to talk about 
some of those side effect things a little bit. And then these are wires, they're mechanical wires. They break, they fracture, they get old, they crack. And so um, we're starting into this group of patients that are 10 or 15 years out and we're having to replace wires because they're both. I've had a couple people fall and crack the wires too. I used to think that wouldn't happen, but I've seen it. Okay, this surgery is complicated because it's very involved. It's actually two surgeries. Right? The first surgery puts the wires in the brain. The second surgery puts in the battery pack. I usually wait a week in between the two surgeries. After each surgery, you go home the next day. And you're at home for that week in between the two surgeries. So this is a typical process. And it, I think of it kind of as a three month block of your time. So if you're planning a trip to Cabo or wherever, Make sure that we set the timing so that you're around for about three months because it's going to take that long to get through the surgical process and to get the programming and medicine adjusted to the point where you're fully back at home and functioning like you are before. So a few months before surgery, you come to see me. Um, a couple weeks before surgery, we get an MRI scan of the brain. I use that in the operating room to target where we're going to go. Uh, the day of surgery, we put on a halo. We get a CAT scan. We take you to the operating room. I'm going to show you a video of what happens. Uh, then you spend the night in the hospital. Almost everybody is one night in the hospital. And then the surgery is the next week. You come to see me two weeks after surgery. You should probably see Pam, my PA, Pam call back here at the table. And then we see you several times in those three months just to check on your recovery from the surgical aspect of the treatment. And then during those several months after surgery, your senior neurologist, Dr. Aldridge and Mark, or some of the other neurologists we work with, and they're programming. Pro this is like, it's not a computer program, but it's adjusting the simulator. And Jamie's is going to talk about the different parameters. It's kind of a complicated process. And it's basically an art form. There's not a standard way to do it. Adjusting medications, changing the stimulation voltage, frequency, and which wires are simulated. Okay. So, there's two keys to success in this treatment. The first one is up to me, putting the wires in exactly the right location. And then the second key to good outcome is that post-operative care of your disease, either your tremor, central tremor, or your Parkinson's, programming, medication adjustments. If you just have the surgery, it's not going to work until you get programmed and adjusted properly. All right. So it's a collaboration, it's a group effort. Here's a couple of videos. Um, this is a gentleman with essential tremor. There he is before surgery and after surgery, uh, trying to take a drink from the cup. It's kind of a delayed video. So there you can see. There's still a little bit of tremor, but compared to before, I mean, it's, it's quite a bit better. He's able to drink from the cup. By the way, I don't have any training. <laughs> yeah, my, my simulator works great. <laughs> All right, here's the effect on handwriting. An essential tremor. So this is Freddie again trying to. Ah! Silence. This is Jamie's video, by the way. So here's before surgery. This gentleman had a really severe tremor, intention tremor. And he's trying to do something with intention. Basically can't draw or write. And he still has problems. I mean, it's not a perfect spiral, but it's systematic. He was able to actually write his name and, and dial a phone, drink from a cup, really practical things. So that's a very good outcome. Not everybody does that well. Okay? We're going to show you our good patients. Right? Not everybody does that. Okay, um, the surgery, let's talk about this. This is the fun part. Uh, patients, I think you'll enjoy this part. I'm going to show you a couple pictures from the operating room, kind of talk about some of the technical details, and then we have a program that's actually getting a little bit dated now, I think it's four years old, that uh, has some intraoperative video and some patient test testimonials and stuff, so we're going to play that. I think it's about 10 minutes long. So, the right location in the brain. Let's go back. It's a little teaser. The right location of the brain is the size of a pistachio or a pearl. 
It's very small. And you've all seen that wire. It's about twice the size of the diameter of that wire. Right? And if we miss that spot, the stimulator is not going to work right. Either you're going to have side effects or no benefit. And so the placement of that wire in the brain is very precise. And we have all these tools that I use to make sure we're going to the right spot and we're in the right spot. Some of those tools are mechanical. I'm going to show you the mechanical part. Some of them are neurophysiological, meaning that we turn it on and we listen to your brain cells and we see what stimulation effect is on, has on your symptoms. And then some of it is imaging. We actually take a CAT scan in the operating room and we see that the wire is where we think it's supposed to be. Okay? So to get the precision we need, we use a halo. And the halo is food in the skull. Sounds a little barbaric, doesn't it? The good news is I numb your skin up before I put it on. <laughs> and the notion of it seems painful, but it really is not that painful. You put hundreds and hundreds of frames on it. And it's very rare for patients to faint or scream out in pain. Most of them say, oh, well, it's bad as I thought it was good. It's the worst anticipation. It's, it's the anticipation that's bad. Okay, so then we bring you to the operating room, we get your position comfortable, and that frame actually attaches to the bed. So you can't move your head around, but you can move your arms and legs. We do some targeting, computerized targeting. So here's the subthalamic nucleus target for Parkinson's. Here's the thalamic target for central tremor. And here's the globus pallidus internus. Which, so these two targets are for Parkinson's. Right? This square box is one centimeter. Right? One centimeter. So you can see the spot we want to hit is actually a sub area inside this nucleus. So it's a mini spot in the brain. So we have a computer system that helps us get there. All right, so here's a picture from the operating room. This is the software we use. It's called FrameLink. And uh, we pick the location, the little red dot is where we want to put the wire in the subthalamic nucleus. And then this uh, dotted line is a simulation of where the wire is going to go. So we can pick the location it's going to go, and then we can pick any location on the surface of the brain that we want to start the wire out. The mechanical device kind of looks like this. It attaches to that frame. We'll see that in the video. And then the wire passes down these guide tubes right to the center of the frame. So there's the DVS wire. And the crosshair of the two, two windows on the side. And so you line them up and then the wire is right to the middle of that mechanical frame. So during the surgery, uh, you're awake. Not for the whole thing. You're asleep when we drill a hole. Okay? You're asleep when we inject low class eggs. You don't feel any pain in operating. Um, I usually have patients wake up, not all the time. We're going to talk about that at the end. Uh, the reason we tend to have you awake is we want to turn it on and see if it works. And if you're asleep, we never know if it works. That's the reason we wake you up. You don't have to be awake, but it, it's kind of fun to have. Okay. So you can see, the, here's a patient. This is the CAT scanner. Their head's inside the CAT scanner, the whole case. And here's our great DBS team, Pat Nelson. The DBS Medtronic representative with John Cahill and this is Jamie Mark. And so they're testing. This patient's having his handwriting being tested. And you can see his arms are free and legs and moving things around. OK, let's watch the video. Your discretion advised. It's not going. Fortunately, there's a procedure called deep brain stimulation 
that can give these patients a new lease on life. <clears throat> My hand it was constantly like this. Both hands were here. And the first doctor that I talked to, and like I say, he, there was a lot of older people in that waiting room, you know. And so, and he told me I had Parkinson's, and he watched the other patients there, and he goes, wow, I don't want to end up like this. So I said, I diagnosed 15 years ago, and up until about five or six years ago, I was controlled pretty well with medication, and then that began to not work so well. About 2001, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's at 38 years old, which is pretty young. And, um, progressively gotten worse over the years. Within the field of neurosurgery and neurology, I think deep brain stimulator is one of the most exciting and really phenomenal treatments that we have. Most of what I do in neurosurgery is preventative or it's treating really catastrophic things that have happened to people. But deep brain stimulation it fixes people, it makes them better, it takes them from a state of disability and returns them into a state of function. For people like Tom, Mike, Lori, and Shane, the continued loss of control of their bodies gave each of them a bleak outlook. As I encourage you, we get uh, uh, we get to work on some hot electrical panels and things, and it's kind of shaky to, to worry about uh, going into an electrical panel with your hand shaking. I got to the point of medication that was too much high and low, and it was not working the way that I needed it to to even be able to function for a while. I wasn't able to even write with my right hand without taking it and pushing it along. And what were your options at that time? Well, it's nothing. Like you said, you know, just deal with it. Just deal with it. But he says, you've got about five years. I think five years, you, you will have to do something. Because I don't have to do choices. Well, I was taking away my ability to really be able to plan to do much of anything from day to day because it was so erratic as to whether or not the medication would work from day to day. To place a DVS system in the brain actually has two surgeries. The first surgery places the wires into the brain. That's the critical surgery. The second surgery comes back a week later with wires in connection down to a pacemaker like device that sits in the chest. The goal of the surgery is to place these small wires into a very tiny location of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus. It's about the size of a small almond. And so we use many different pieces of equipment and different techniques to make sure we're getting into the right spot. Then we stimulate the brain uh, with electricity and we see if it has an effect on their tremor or their stiffness. So this is our this is our planning software where we merge the different images that we've collected about this patient's brain and we pick the target we're going to go to inside the brain tissue. This is a very sophisticated software that lets us do this planning. Okay, are you comfortable? Does your neck feel good? You ready? Okay, let's do it. See, she's away. It's going great. How about you? So this is called our phantom base. It simulates where we're going inside the brain. So I set the coordinates in the brain on the phantom, and I set the coordinates on the arc, and we'll make sure that they line up together as double check. During the deep brain simulation of wire placement, there's multiple steps in the process. The first step is uh, we bring you into the operating room and get you situated very comfortably on the bed. The second step is we give you some stations for your sleep. We make two small incisions on your head behind the hairline. And then we throw some holes so we can get down to the surface of your brain. Then you wake up and we begin the surgery when you're awake. Now, it's remarkable that the brain has no sensory fibers, so you can't feel anything when we're doing things in your brain. Okay, so we can start with that. Okay, it's off. All right. Andy, are you awake? The brain has billions of neurons, and neurons communicate with each other. They communicate through what are called action potentials, which is a small discharge or depolarization of the neuron. With the microelectrode, we're actually able to hear and pick up those discharges. One of the things that microelectrode recording is very good for is helping us define where we are in the patient's brain. It verifies for us that we're passing through the targeted region and it lets us very precisely put that wire within a submillimeter accuracy of the brain. Okay, all our equipment are double checked and we're ready to go in. So we're going to advance this little microelectrode now. Press 
17. Okay, we're all hooked up to the microelectrodes. Let's see if we got some signal. So it looks like there's some kinesthetic cells in there that are responding to activation of our arm. So this is the GPS wire we're going to put inside the brain. Got four little contacts, and we can stimulate each of those little metal contacts through our stimuli. And here they are working on your brain, and you're not feeling anything. Not feeling a thing, like awake. Was it weird? It was weird. It was uh, it was kind of big excitement, awake, strange, uh, but uh, it was good. I had I had no pain memories. When we're stimulating, we're of course testing the patient, and we have them move their hand and look for the tremor and move their arms, look at the stiffness, and um, see how fast they can open close their hands, which is a sign of the slowness. Stimulating three and four volts now. And much more better English. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Okay. So we've taken an intraoperative CAT scan of the wire in the brain while we're in the operating room still. And we've taken those pictures and put it onto our planning station and we can verify that the wire is exactly where we want it to be. The deep brain stimulation procedure is truly revolutionary, especially when you see the dramatic results. This is Shane Wilson, and he's uh, a gentleman with Parkinson's disease. He was diagnosed nine years ago. And in April of this year, of 2010, we implanted deep brain stimulators uh, for treatment of this Parkinson's disease. And to start with, change the device like I said above, and now I'm just going to turn it back on. We've been very fortunate. Uh, that first shower and I uh, started doing this procedure 14, 16 years ago now, and then we brought in Jamie Mark as a nurse practitioner, and she's been with us for 10 years, and now the addition of Dr. Carlson uh, as a surgeon as well. Um, we're very fortunate, and I think we have done as many cases as uh, you know, a lot of the big centers on the West Coast, and, and we're having great success, and, and the patients you know, will tell you. As a Parkinson's patient, you feel like your whole life's going to be taken away from you in some way. So to have that feeling of being under the right care was so important. And this surgery did so many wonderful things. It really gave me my life back. Do you feel like you have a new piece of life? A new, very, very much. Uh, if anybody with, that has the tremors of any kind of Parkinson's essential, uh, I would go for this procedure any day of the week. It's actually brain surgery, but it's it's worth it. People say you come up to me and say, gosh, why you know, you don't want to go. I go, what are you talking about? I go, oh yeah, I'm gonna have No, really, I don't have the tremors. Okay, so let's turn your stitcher on. Hey, could it be? Ooh, we're gonna get a little rush for just a second. There was a tremor. My advice for anybody that's concerning me is not to be afraid to do it. <laughs> I mean, it is brain surgery, but it wasn't nearly as traumatic as what, it, what, as what I thought the experience would be. And for the good and the benefit that it's given me, if I had to do it once every year to keep going like this, <laughs> I'd do it in a heartbeat. I would do it all over again. I wish I'd done it sooner. It's just totally it's been a miracle for me to get my life back. As you've seen in this half hour, the Providence Neuroscience Program offers not only cutting-edge treatment, but also exceptional and compassionate care. I'm Nadine Woodward, and thanks for watching. Okay. We're short on time, so I'm going to skip through all this. But just to let you know, we're doing we're doing some scientific research on the surgery. So if you end up coming kind of getting surgery, with us, we're going to probably ask you to be involved in some of these different projects, which is very exciting. And uh, okay, so this little slide of our team. This is a team effort, and it's a team across multiple medical practices. This is not just one group. We all have different businesses and work with different people. But we work together as a team to, to coordinate your care. All right? 
two neurosurgeons, Dr. Hirschauer and myself, uh, our movement disorder team, Dr. Alder and Dr. Greeley, Jamie Mark, uh, and an integral part of that team is John Cahill and Pat Kautzman. And then we work with lots of regional neurologists as well, second year neurologists maybe on this list. If it is, then just ask them, they can send it to us for referral. Otherwise, if you're interested in this treatment, then get in contact with one of us. I always have to say thank you. Uh, today, big thank you to the Providence Foundation. They've been supporting us so well with our food and our location, but also with the equipment we use in the operating room. So a big thank you to the foundation, our Parkinson's Resource Center, uh, our Neuro Providence Neuroscience Institute, and Medtronic. Um, let's get our team up. We've never done this before, but I want everybody to come up, or stand up at least. So uh, John Cahill in the white shirt and tie. It's our Medtronics rep. Where'd Pat go? There's Pat. Pat Kaltzman. Pat, how many years have you been doing DBS? Uh, longer than I'd like to admit. 17. 17. Okay, no, 17. Uh, Katie McLeod is my research assistant. So if you do research with us, she'll be taking care of all the aspects of that. And Pam McLeod is my physician's assistant. She takes care of our medical therapy. And Jamie Mark, sorry, nurse practitioner that takes care of our patients. So and that's picture of us. So we're short on time. Thank you. Let's just for short. Let's just go ahead and jump into Jamie's presentation, and then hopefully we get that done in 20 minutes. I'll be back. They never leave any time for me. And then, and then, well, we want to answer all your questions. Best a lot of uh, what I have here today, so I'll go relatively quickly, and then we um, have some very nice patients here with us today who've been implanted with PBS, who have come and they're willing to share their story and answer any questions you might have. When I do these talks or send patients to the local support group, patients always tell me the most beneficial piece oftentimes prior to being implanted is actually meeting and talking with other patients who've had it done. Um, in saying that, I want you all to know we have a local DBS support group in part run with uh, John Cahill and Pat and then Cindy in the back of the Parkinson's Resource Center. It meets once a month, typically on the third or fourth Thursday from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at uh, the PRC, which is uh, located on um, Washington and about 6th Avenue. So it's a really helpful group. If you, um, you know, want to learn more about DBS, if you are scheduled for surgery, if you've had the surgery, uh, anyone's welcome to come. The focus is kind of DBS more than just general disease management, but it's really helpful. And in all the patients I've set, uh, sent there, they've just had nothing but wonderful comments. So just a, a little plug for that as well. So we've kind of talked about this, but the point I want to make about the DBS team is sometimes when patients are entering into the idea of deep brain stimulation therapy, it's a little bit overwhelming. And, and part of what makes it overwhelming is we're sending you to multiple places and making multiple appointments, but there's a method to our madness. The reason we have all of these individuals on our DBS team is to provide a real thorough, appropriate evaluation. We want to make sure that you're a good candidate going into the surgery and that we can help you. And if we have any concerns with your memory or your mood or your swallowing or something along the way, we want to be able to address that and make sure in doing the surgery, we've educated you on your individual risk and benefit. So there are a lot of people and you know, sometimes people say to me, gosh, why do I have to see all these individuals? But there really is a reason for it. So there's a lot of people on the team and, and it helps us provide the best outcome we can. We've talked about 
the different targets today um just to rate reiterate uh the ventral intermediate nucleus we use for primarily for essential trimmer years ago it was used for parkinsonian trimmer we really don't do that commonly anymore rather for parkinson's we use the gpi and the SPN. and then for dystonia most of the time gpi but sometimes we would elect to implant stn the decision of where your leader implant it is, is nothing that you guys will be responsible for. That's under our auspices, and we uh, very carefully, as a team, decide. One of the things we started doing with uh, Dr. Aldrich coming on board is, as a team, we meet once a month, and we review all of our upcoming uh, cases. We look at the patient's charts, we look at patient videos, and we go over the cases in really great detail. And that's, again, what makes part of it a great PBS team. What's nice is, you know, although we have a lot of patients here in Spokane, we see a lot of patients around the region. We have multiple patients from Montana, uh, more the central part of Washington, Idaho, uh, that come to us. And so we try and also make, as part of our DBS team, as Dr. Carlson referenced, including neurologists from outlying areas. And I know we're on telehealth today, and that's part of the point to reach out and get this information across to people out there. Because with the advent of this new patient programmer, which we've talked a little bit about, there's a lot more variance in what I can do with programming and what I can allow for patients to do at home. So even if you live five hours away, DDS is still possible for you. We do have to do the surgery here in Spokane at Sacred Heart right next door, but other things can be done uh, a little bit remotely as well. So the point with this slide is to let you know, as, as Dr. Carlson said, the surgery is the same. Our technique is really the same regardless of where we're implanting. But these structures are relatively close to one another. That there in lies the importance of getting the lead in the right location. So when we talk about how is DBS successful, first we have to have a good candidate, but then we have to get the lead in the right spot, and they're very tiny little parts in the brain where we implant these leads. We have to program the device and manage you afterwards correctly. Um, and then we also have to manage the side effects that can happen with stimulation. If we look at any of the disease states, I'm gonna start with Parkinson's. The other thing we have to do, number one, is patient education. That's a lot of what I do and a lot of what I spend my time doing. Uh, we have to talk about expectations. You know, going into this surgery, how is it going to benefit you? How are you going to improve? What is it likely to help? The key point for Parkinson's is that you're only as good as your best on time. And Dr. Oldred referenced earlier off time when your medicine's worn off and you're more symptomatic, and then on time when the medicine's kicked on and you're doing better. So part of the reason with Parkinson's that it's really important that we time the surgery correctly is that as you progress over time, your on time might not be quite as good and it might not be lasting quite as long. And so when people come to me and they're at that point where we're saying to them, you really need to have this done now, you really shouldn't wait any longer, this is why. We can't predict what your on time is going to be like a year down the road or two years down the road, but in our minds, we know it's not going to be as good. So keep in mind your best on time and what you're like. We want to give you more of that time. In a recent study, uh, we found that uh, for Parkinson's patients, we can give them an additional, not just give them, but give them an additional five hours of good on time during the day. That's huge. I mean, that's the, the centerpiece of BDS and what makes it so great for Parkinson's disease. Some patients prior to the surgery might have three to four hours of good on time. We give you four or five more hours in a day, that's all the difference in your quality of life. So you're only as good as your best on time. We don't want to wait too long to do the surgery. The other thing I tell every patient with Parkinson's is think about what you're like when your medicines kick on. The things that improve when your medicines kick on are the things that are most likely to improve with surgery. Now, earlier Dr. Carlson talked about gait freezing, and of course most patients with Parkinson's come in and they say, is it going to help my walking? Is it going to help my balance? And I always say that's a little bit of a gray area and it's difficult for us to know. I've had patients after the surgery, their walking is better, they are falling less, and I've had some patients say they don't have much of a difference. Again, the key is, what were you like before the surgery? Did the medicines help your walking, your gait freezing? Because if we can give you an additional five hours of on time, you will be better in that regard. And then, as we've already referenced, it's not helpful for memory, typically not uh, going to be helpful for speech. And when I say balance, in general, it's not helpful for the balance where people are easily falling backwards. 
but i've had a couple of patients over the years that were very dyskinetic prior to surgery and they were having a lot of falls because of their dyskinesia we, after the surgery, were able to reduce, if not completely eliminate, their dyskinesia, and their falling was much less. So we can't always say it won't help with balance, but in a general sense, we don't feel it will improve balance. So I've, we've kind of already talked about this, but, but you'll hear us use this term called window of opportunity with Parkinson's disease. In general now, we believe that's about five to 10 years after diagnosis. That, for most people, is going to be a very good time to implant. Now, uh, you know, we just implanted someone a couple weeks ago who's had Parkinson's for 19 years. She's progressed very slowly, done very well. So it's not to say you have to fall in that window, but we do have to be thinking about DBS for Parkinson's earlier than what we used two years ago. So essential tremor, again, patient expectations. You know, what do we expect to improve and get better? For people with essential tremor, um, there's a lot of disability associated with their disease and tasks such as writing, drinking from a cup, eating, buttoning a shirt, just your daily tasks can be, for a lot of people, impossible. Our expectation with the surgery is to reduce your tremor by about 80%, but it doesn't completely resolve for everyone, and that's an important point. When I say, you know, looking at a patient, what type of tremor, severity, rotation, we tend to find, in general, that patients with a really high frequency um, but low amplitude, small size type of tremor like this, that tends to respond the best, and those are the people that might say, gosh, I don't feel like I have any tremor at all after surgery. People with a larger, more robust, or what we call ataxic tremor, um, we can definitely get improvement in that, but not necessarily as much. So prior to the surgery, when we're meeting with you, talking about your tremor, we should be you know, kind of going over those expectations with you. And then for dystonia, um, you know, as you can see in those videos, people with dystonia um, have a, a wide range as far as how affected they are. But in general, we really hope to be able to reduce pain, improve range of motion. Um, our patients who we've implanted who uh, have dystonia oftentimes are able to maybe not completely, but, but really lessen their pain meds, their muscle relaxers, those types of medicines. Um, the important point to note is that if someone has a contracture or a posture that is fixed skeletally, so the bone has fused in that way, we can't help that type of posturing. So that's, again, something as we're evaluating patients with dystonia, we talk about and, and we go over with them. But if it's not fused in a, in a structure skeletally with your bone and it's just muscular in nature, we certainly hope to improve that type of contracture. So we talk a lot in clinic and in our presentations about the surgery and what we do before the surgery, but I just want to plug the importance of following the surgery, the fact that things have to be done. Um, I had a patient years ago who came to the office and said, you know, what do you think we have to program this? We just thought it was the surgery and, and you're done. There's a lot of programming that goes on after, and that's my big role in the clinic. So I'll see people for their initial programming two to four weeks after they've had the lead implanted. And then I'll see them again every two to four weeks for the first couple of months. And then we'll spread it out from there based on how you're doing. The least complicated programming tends to be for those with essential tremor, because we're just dealing with tremor. And a lot of times, patients aren't on a lot of medicines. So they don't need to reduce much. Um, and then next is probably Parkinson's. People are on more meds. Um, they've got more symptoms that we're looking to improve. So that you know, takes a little longer, maybe six months to kind of reach a happy, stable uh, endpoint. Uh, and then dystonia is the one that takes the longest, only because it takes the longest to see the effect. So for people with dystonia, we're trying out settings, trying to increase the voltage, get the parameters higher, um, but it takes a little longer oftentimes to see the benefit. So what I try and tell people is, you know, because we've ramped all our expectations up to this surgery, but then after the surgery, it does take time. So don't get discouraged if you're starting your programming and after the first or second programming, you're not seeing as much benefit as you would like. It does take time afterwards. So we've kind of just talked about um, the electrodes and the battery a little bit. Um, this is just to reference the fact that you can have a single electrode plugged into one battery, or we do have dual channel systems uh, available where we have, you know, you have a lead on each side of the brain, but then it's tunneled down to just one battery and both leads plug into one battery. So we have single channel and dual channel systems. Again, based on your situation, um, with your help and us as a team, we'll help decide what 
battery we feel is best for you. We do also have a rechargeable battery um, that we utilize, not a lot, but that we utilize in certain instances, so that's a possibility as well. So the great thing about DBS therapy is it's adjustable. As we've said, that's why it's more beneficial um, than a lot of the older surgical techniques. There's all kind of parameters we adjust. We adjust the electrodes on the lead uh, to vary the location and or the shape of our simulation. We can adjust uh, the amplitude or the voltage, the pulse width, the rate. So there's all kinds of adjustability to this device. Um, sometimes patients get on the internet and they come to me and they say, I read there were 47,000 possibilities. You know, how are you going to find my setting? It's not that complicated with a good candidate and a well-placed lead, but there are a lot of things you can do with the stimulation. This is just kind of a visual for you guys to get an idea of when we talk about amplitude, pulse width, rate. So amplitude is kind of the juice, the level of, of uh, electricity. The pulse width is the duration of the stimulus. And then the rate is the number of pulses per second. Again, these are all parameters we're using with your programming to get the best result and to minimize side effect. And then just another important point, kind of one of the exciting things about DBS, as we've referenced a little bit, is medication reduction. I think especially for people with Parkinson's disease, by the time they're entering into surgery, they've been taking medicines multiple times a day, maybe multiple medicines every day. Uh, and up until the advent of DBS, we never had an opportunity to reduce. When we would come in, we just add on more medicine, add on more medicine. Now with the advent of DBS, we have the opportunity to reduce medication. Statistically, this is just the most recent study. Um, with GPI implants, the likelihood of reduction is a little less than with STN. Um, I would say just anecdotally from our practice, I think with STN implant, we oftentimes get close to a 40 to 50 percent medication reduction. And again, that's just significant in cost, quality of life, and my side effects from the meds, all of those types of things. For a simple term of patients, um, you know, potentially we, we might be able to get you off all of your terminal meds. Most of the time for an essential tremor patient, by the time they've considered surgery or they're at that point, the medicines aren't working for them and that's why they're considering surgery. So oftentimes people aren't on any medicines or they're not working very well, but we do have the potential to get you all the way off. And then for dystonia, um, we may be able to reduce most of your medicines, but we're definitely going to do it one medicine at a time and very slowly. Same is true for Parkinson's. It's a slow titration. We don't go off a lot of medicine all at once. So it does take time, but at the end of the day, being on less medicine is, is really a great uh, improvement for DBS as well. So I think that's um, all I had. I knew I would have to be quick with the students too. So um, just our, our office uh, number and name if, if anyone wants to write it down and has questions, wants to call or get an appointment. And then um, lastly, I'm going to have um, over there Nurse Kelsey come up. And then we have a couple patients here, Don and Walt. You guys want to come up? They, they said yes, but now they're looking a little hesitant. <laughs> You know, the patient share their experience, and then, you know, at the end, we'll answer questions, and that includes these guys up here, too, because some of your questions might be more related to having actually had the surgery and more patient based. So, we'll start with Don. Don is a gentleman with a central tremor. And, Don, when were you implanted? How long has it been now? 2012. So, we're almost at the three year mark here. And I'm trying to remember, with, with the central tremor, sometimes we only implant one side at a time. Is that what we did with you, or did we do both at once? OK, so we did the first in January of 2012, and the second in April of 2012. With Parkinson's um, and or dystonia, we would tend to implant both leads on the same day, the same surgery. With the central tremor, we often stage it. We separate the two. So that was the case for Don. So Don, tell me, before the surgery, what was your tremor like? What, what was it causing difficulty with? Well, I had 
And I, uh, I was taking 250 milligrams of propanolol a day, and it really wasn't doing me any good. So I was at a point where I was actually ready for the surgery. Yeah, and that's, again, what typically happens. So um, Don was saying he had trouble eating, drinking, writing, kind of any activity of daily living was getting really challenging. Yeah. So uh, tell these guys about the surgery. What do you think about it? Well, I think that's the most painless surgery I've ever went through in my life. And it was probably the easiest that you went through. What else have you been through? I've had two knee surgeries. So if you think that this is painful, it's not. Go get your knees done. <laughs> A little plug for the orthopedics there. Um, Okay, good. And after the surgery, do you remember, I can't really remember, but do you remember um, in the first programming session if you noticed improvement? Did it take a few sessions? No, this was automatic. After the surgery was done, and Dr. Carlson put the, the pacemakers and everything in, and I went back a week later and seen him and Jamie, and the minute they turned it on, it was a 100% success. So with essential tremor, again, because we're only uh, really dealing with tremor, um, it's it's a little easier job on our end of programming and whatnot. And uh, on that first day, we get the device turned on and we get some stimulation going. It's not necessarily going to be the highest setting where you're ultimately at, but getting some good response and hopefully seeing some improvement early on. And as I just recall on settings in my mind, I think he's still uh, pretty low with the settings. And, and now, how often do I see it? About every Three months. Every, every three months. So we follow up every three months. We don't always make changes every time. We maybe check the battery, check the device. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, just depending on what he's doing. So, John, let's just, do you mind if, if I have them uh, lift your hands with your device on and off? Okay. So, with both hands, will you just hold them out? Good. And with this right hand, touch your finger to your nose and back out. And with the left hand, Good. And then your two fingertips in close to one another, not quite touching. Okay. So let's, this is the little patient programmer. So let's uh, turn the devices off and just see how things look in the off position. And typically when we turn the devices off, um, people don't feel much of anything, but you can already see just with doing that, how Dawn's tremor uh, comes back right away. right away when we turn it off, and it gets better fairly quickly when we turn it on. Now, interestingly, and, and for a lot of people with essential tremor, and Dr. Aldrin pointed this out earlier, you know, so for essential tremor, we say it's a movement-based tremor, so at rest, you don't see much, but then as people go to move, they really shake. You can see in Don's case, his tremor, uh, his essential tremor is severe enough that even at a rest position, um, he's fairly tremulous. You even kind of notice some in his head and a little bit in his speech. So um, definitely different. So Don, go ahead one time, just hold both arms out for me. And then again, try touching your finger to your nose. Okay, that's good. Don't hurt yourself. Other hands, you want to try the other Great. And then the two um, hands and fingertips, not quite touching. Very cool. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get them both back on. Now when we turn the devices back on, Sometimes people feel a little bit, sometimes some tingling, or like uh, Lori in the video, she said, oh, I feel a little bit of a rush. Tell us, Dawn, if you feel, do you feel much of anything when we turn it back on? A little bit, a little bit of tingling? Yes. Okay. Okay. 
And let's see how quickly, so it's almost immediate, it's just pretty, pretty tremendous. Huh? Good. Thanks, Mom. Great. I'm going to have you stay up here while we talk to Walt, but I'm going to have you stay here because there might be questions. Okay, so Walt um, is a gentleman with Parkinson's disease. We kind of wanted to have a representation. We, we have some patients with dystonia. I don't think we have any here today, unfortunately, but um, we kind of wanted to have a representation with both diseases since we were talking about both today. So Walt, tell me, when were you first symptomatic with your Parkinson's? How long ago? Oh, boy. 2008, okay. And then when did we implant your devices? Uh, a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, okay. So Walt very much falls into that category of, okay, let's watch um, the Parkinson's symptoms and make sure we're implanting at the right time. We did it a little bit on what might be considered, you know, that earlier window of opportunity, but the right time for Walt. So Walt, um, just tell us why why did you decide upon having DDS surgery? Removed uh, the uh, amount of drugs I was taking. The okay. So Walt was taking the amount of drugs he had to take to be functional was causing that involuntary rolling right movement dyskinesia. Yeah. Okay. And um, tell me about your surgery, what you remember about it. I think the worst part is getting there at 5 a.m. Yeah, getting there at 5 a.m. That's, that's not so fun. That's not so fun. That's, that's all this guy's responsibility. I don't want to be there that early either. It's him. Fantastic. Good, good. Your recovery, was it very difficult? No. Good, pretty easy. Um, so remind me, what symptoms other than dyskinesia did you have before the surgery? Um, the shaking, the trembling, the shuffling, the So tremor, shuffling, those types of things. And then um, after surgery, what things have you noticed improvements in? Um, All of them. So tremor, dyskinesia, shuffling. Okay, good. And what, um, I don't know, I, I should look at your chart before I came. Have you been able to reduce medicine? Absolutely, my yeah, I was going to say, I think we're probably at 80%, maybe 70, 80% less. So again, there's there's a variance as far as percentage of reduction, some people more, some people less. It depends on how much you're on when you're coming into the surgery, but certainly the, the reduction usually is, is pretty significant for people. Yeah. So let's just see a couple things for you. If you hold both your arms out, and then if you touch your finger to your nose, and back out, and other hand. Good. Now, um, with your right hand, go ahead and open and close. And with your left hand, go ahead and open and close. Good. And then I know it's hard for a lot of you to see, but let's see, you just uh, keep your heel on the ground and tap a toe on the right side. Good. And then on the left side. And then let's, I, I don't know how your walking will be with it off, but let's see with it on. Are you able to get up now the chair without pushing off? Do that? Okay, and can you just kind of walk down? <laughs> I don't know if it'll be different with it off, but we'll see. <laughs> and then you come on back. <laughs> We're all surrounding you. <laughs> Stress makes your symptoms worse, too. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, do you mind if we track your devices real quick? Is that okay? You know, as we've said, we're certainly looking at tremor, but we're also looking at speed of movement, um, rigidity, walking, all those types of things. We haven't done this for a while. We've been trying to for a while. So. Okay. So again, remember uh, with Don's case and, and his being essential tremor with movement, he had more tremor. You can see uh, for Wall, it's more in a rest position that he has tremor. Let's just see with the hands if you open and close. Go ahead, people. So what we're kind of looking for, and it's um, something that we as clinicians pick up on, is speed of movement and rhythm, and waltz with the devices on are, are certainly far, far better. How do you feel with that? Good. Not good? Not good. <laughs> okay, with your toe, let's just see, can you tap your toe? That still looks pretty good, not too bad. And then the left foot. Yeah, a lot harder on that left foot to move, huh? And then let's see if, um, if we have you get up and down the chair and walk, and I'm gonna make sure Dr. Aldridge is real close here. He needs to catch up. 
Okay, so still out of the chair pretty good. And not too bad with the walking either, maybe a little bit slower. Definitely the tremor, but not too bad. Uh, trouble turning though, huh? We talked about that, how difficult turning is. One more time walking. He's gonna, he wants you to do it one more time. <laughs> yeah, really, God. There's a little electrical wearing off as well, like with medication where you can kind of tell that it's wearing off, and then the more and more you um, kind of go without medication, the longer you go, the more off you are. That's definitely something to see. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to get them back on. Show today it would be a little bit more open, 
book open ended kind of thing, you wouldn't be able to make sort of a somewhat of a guarantee that you're like very likely to see good improvement. Um, if the areas that we would place the electrodes in the brain were visibly not not abnormal, visibly not damaged, I would say that that kind of person would be more likely to have a good outcome if there was no problem with the structure of the brain from the injury and it was more microscopic. But it is a bit of a different different model of sorry, Carlson. Yeah, there's a very special category of post-traumatic brain injury mood disorders, and it's a very heterogeneous group of people that are related to hypoxic brain injury or actual shear injury to the different parts of the brain. And um, the, if it looks like a central tremor, it'll probably get better from surgery. If it's an ataxia from pure cerebral damage where it's a wide, uncoordinated motion, that's probably not going to be better. So it just totally depends on the circumstances. What do you do with the leaves when you're waiting for them? Well, we coil them up under the skin and close all the skin up so they just sit there. And I actually put a little plastic adapter on the, the other end of the wire so I can feel it. So when I do the second surgery, I can make a cut in the skin just right above that wire so I don't have to unwind everything. Yeah, and then that gets pulled down and it's in the spot. Yes? Your tremor comes and goes over different months. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Is it Parkinson's tremor? Central tremor? Interesting. Well, stress can certainly be a driver of the tremor. I would say that stress, medications, maybe things in your diet, uh, you know, other things that we're not aware of uh, could be triggers to exacerbate that tremor. Is, is all, if you have a central tremor, the, the condition is always there, but it may be one of degree. Uh, some, it's, it's, it's strange to have a tremor that would go away completely, but uh, you know, I suspect it could be brought out with certain ways of examining that tremor. Um, but uh, the, the tremor is like music going through a radio. It's always there. The stress levels and other environmental factors and triggers uh, kind of turn the volume up and down on the radio, you know, kind of make the tremor worse or better. Maybe identifying factors that are associated with that change in the tremor would be a good idea. Yes. There's a point uh, about having uh, the essential tremor that isn't too bad when he's doing larger movements, gross movements, and all gross motor movements. But then the real fine movement, he's an artist trying to paint real things out. And this is kind of a subgroup of people, like a specific group within uh, those with the essential tremor that have what we call a task specific tremor. So certain tasks can really bring it out. I think that video sort of got at that point that I showed about the lady who sure wasn't that bad, but when she tried to drink, it got worse. And I definitely see that. Um, and the, the, it's a very, very interesting group. Um, there's not that many people with tremor like that, but we definitely see it. Um, past specific tremor, it really is a, just a form of essential tremor, so that's not unusual. Like we said earlier, there are factors that, that make it better and worse, and looking for, for those would be a, uh, one thing to do, try to avoid uh, aggravating factors. Uh, but uh, that tremor, if it's a very big tremor, if you're doing fine motor tasks, there's a very big tremor, Usually that's the kind of tremor that we would want to go after with DBS. If it's a fine, still if it's no tremor or minimal tremor, it goes from very mild to kind of mild or mild moderate. Medication will often work really, really well. I just tell the story occasionally. When I was at OHSU, as a, a movement service fellow, we had a, a nurse, uh, she got a, a very coveted job of an IV here. So are there any nurses here? You know, so they're kind of like, you know, oh there's like, goodness. They're, 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 your, they're your kind of your injury job sometimes, and then like the ones you kind of really are going for, you want to try to 
the new Marine County. This is her big job. She just wanted to do this IV therapy job, really good hours, and really good situation for her. And she, uh, she said, you know, I always had a little bit of a tremor, but then when I started doing lots of IVs, I, my tremor would come out right when I'm putting IVs in patients' arms, and I just, I can't believe this is happening. What can we, what can we do about this? And so. I mean, it was big, it was a big, and I had her kind of demonstrate how she would put an IV in on me with not a needle, but, uh, <laughs> and, and it, it was all over the place. And so uh, uh, it wasn't severe, it was moderate. Um, treated her with a pretty low dose of propranolol, turned her one way completely. She was very, very happy. She continued on. So there's a task specific tumor like that. There's a patient actually that's going into work right now that has a very task specific tumor that we're looking at. One thing that's really interesting about those folks uh, like that is that uh, when you go with the microelectrode recording that Dr. Carlson spoke about, you often don't really hear the, the tremor cells and the firing that we take to see the central tremor unless you have the new writing right then and there, and in which case it will spike. It will really start to spike. Otherwise, it's really, really quiet. And one of the last procedures I did at my old place in Wisconsin, uh, the surgeon was kind of on the table saying, are you sure this patient really has tremor? I promise they do. We didn't really hear a lot, so I could understand where they were coming from. And as soon as we had them write, which is the surgery you do a lot of times just keep the patients awake, had them write and draw, all of a sudden the thalamus started firing and it took away what we see. So it's really it's kind of a really interesting different group, but very task specific tremor is just it's real common. I mean it's not very common, but it's common enough that we do see it treated the same. Why is the cardiac pacemaker more complicated? There's several reasons for it in terms of the surgery. The big reason is we can't get an MRI scan in the brain. Okay. And the MRI is used to target the location we're going to go to. Um, the way we get around that is we do a CAT scan with some special contracts. And then the other way is just that you have a medical condition on your heart and you, uh, you know, we don't want to make a heart problem worse. So you need a cardiac clearance from your cardiologist. So lots of reasons to have a pacemaker. Some of them are serious and some of them are relatively minor. So the main issue is that we can't get them on. We're still able to target them, which is the cat scan. Yes? Well, I would ask that the patient has a Question is, how long does the battery last? Is it lithium ion or some other kind? Um, Dr. Carlson, I'm going to take this one. Uh, it's a lead acid battery. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Actually, know what the battery's made of. Pat, is it a lithium ion? It's not lithium ion. I asked Pat this not long ago. It's very good. Chargeable lithium ion, and the primary cells are silver, but the oxygen and hydrogen. So there's silver, vanadium, oxide, hybrid, and the other one is a lithium ion or a chargeable one. So we typically end up replacing the battery pack every two to five years, depending on how much electricity is used. So it lasts for a long time. It's kind of like the 9 volt battery in your cell phone. Right? The amount of electricity it takes to have a clinical effect is minuscule. It is a really small amount of electricity, and which is kind of remarkable. The brain is very sensitive, obviously. Uh, and so if the batteries last for a long time. Yeah, in two years, I would say it would be pretty uncommon. But the first folks, case scenarios. Yeah, for, for folks we see with essential tremor who turn the battery off every night, that respond to pretty low dose. I've seen it go up to seven years. And the surgery to replace the battery is very easy and quick. Same day surgery. Go home the same day. It's very little pain. Yes. When people with cervical dystonia or other are all movement disorders, uh, basically go away your sleep. Uh, the, the brain is uh, chemically disconnected from the, 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 the movement part of the brain is chemically disconnected from the rest of the body during true sleep. Um, sometimes people say, "Wait a minute, I don't know. I see my spouse or, some, or someone that I know kind of shake a little bit when they're, you know, in sleep." Well, there are phases of sleep. There's lighter sleep and deeper sleep during uh, stage two through four sleep. Uh, there's, there's minimal uh, connection between the brain and the body. During REM sleep, there's none whatsoever. So, so movement disorders almost always, all, all of them, uh, go away during sleep, except restless leg syndrome and stuff like that. Or REM sleep disorder, which is part of Parkinson's. I just want to know if there's any bad sleep. Yeah, there's a Any cervical dystonia patients? 
we have, so we, we really didn't talk about this dystonia mainly because it's a low number of patients and we have too much stuff to talk about. But dystonia, uh, we do surgery for dystonia. It requires a special research protocol because of the way that government requires us to do surgery on dystonia patients. It's a special thing called a humanitarian use device exemption. Uh, but insurance will pay for it. Sometimes it's a little bit out for the injury. Uh, and we do that here as two. I'm not even sure if University of Washington is doing it for dystonia. The Swedish is the only place in, in, in Seattle that does this, has a dystonia IRB protocol. We do do it here as well. Question up here.